Welcome to History at the OK Corral. Don't forget to subscribe, click the like button, and share this episode with a fellow history lover. Few figures in history conjure up more striking images of the American West than that of the Mountain Man. Though often romanticized, their lives were in fact dirty, difficult, and all too often, violently brief. Tonight, join History at the OK Corral for a look at 10 of the most legendary stories from the history of the Mountain Men. The foothills of the Eastern Rockies, Montana, 1836. As a small contingent of mountain men wearily made their way south along the foothills on their way to the Salmon River, they kept a watchful eye out for both game and their most feared adversary in this territory, the seemingly fearless and innately bellicose Blackfoot. The Blackfoot were a nomadic buffalo hunting tribe, master horsemen who controlled vast swaths of Montana, Idaho, and Alberta. They were formidable foes to any and all who sought to oppose them with a rich, proud warrior culture. And they were none too fond of any who encroached on their territory, be that other tribes or itinerant fur trappers. The trappers were mostly American by nationality, but viewed themselves as entrepreneurs more than settlers or nationalists. The advancement of Manifest Destiny was not the focus of these men who lived so far away from the society of the eastern seaboard that only the pragmatism of survival and economic advancement drove their day-to-day lives. And it was in this pursuit that this contingent of trappers, numbering 20 to 30 men, shot and then field-dressed a few buffalo from a herd that ran across a rolling prairie just east of the foothills. They took the hump meat, ribs, and buffalo skins and hurried to the comparable cover of the foothills to make cooking fires and stem their days-long hunger pains. Soon, the experienced woodsmen had staked their horses, started fires, and set up tripods from which to hang their prized buffalo ribs, while the stakes were laid directly onto the hot coals. The smell of sizzling meat enticed the bedraggled men as they settled down to warm themselves and wait for their dinner to finish cooking. Just then, they heard what Isaac P. Rose described as the most dreadful sound known to man, as a party of Blackfoot warriors, numbering between 30 to 40, swept down the hill that the party of trappers were encamped at the bottom of, whooping and riding their horses at full gallop. As they rode, they let loose a torrent of arrows and musket balls. The trappers ran full tilt into the cover of a small wooded area about 50 yards away, that was actually the low point of the surrounding area and had thus collected about six inches of rainwater. This left the mountain men trapped, hiding in a thicket, hunkering down in a small swamp, unwilling to use their rifles lest they give away their positions. The Blackfoot ransacked the camp, taking all of the furs, the horses, and dry goods that they could carry. However, while they were loading their horses and mounting up to ride away with their spoils, one of the men popped out of the thicket of trees and shot down a Blackfoot warrior who had wrapped himself in one of the trapper's maroon-colored blankets. The Blackfoot were enraged by this, obviously, and rode back to the swampy thicket closer than ever, pouring a volley of arrows in and intending to kill every trapper present. They rode off again, having taken a large bale of red fabric meant for trading, with it trailing behind them, Rosewood would call, like a great trail of fire. As they rode off, some of the trappers made a mad dash for the camp to scoop up anything that Blackfoot had not been able or seen fit to take. Here, Rose and two companions managed to grab around 40 beaver traps and made a dash amidst a hail of arrows and musket balls back to the relative cover of the thicket. From here, the companions who had been covering them with their rifles let loose another volley towards the Blackfoot. This time, they managed to kill three more warriors and wound several others. At this point, the Blackfoot rode until they were well outside of rifle range and convened a small council in full view of the trappers. Seeing this, one of the trappers remarked that they could all relax now because the Blackfoot had apparently had enough of the fighting for the day. But another man, Charles Warfield, rebuked him, saying all present should ready themselves for the Blackfoot's most ferocious effort yet. He had fought the tribe many times before and said that if he did not hear their death howl, then the fight was not over. He was quickly proven correct, as the Council of Blackfoot shortly broke 
and the warriors mounted their horses and made a full-on charge at the thicket. This time, Rose remarked, it was clear that they meant business, which leads one to wonder what they meant before this, but, you know. The Blackfoot made one final desperate and daring attack in an attempt to avenge the deaths of their tribesmen. They came within a few yards of the mountain men, who only managed to repel them due to their experience, cover, and superior weaponry. Two more warriors fell, and finally, after this, the Blackfoot grabbed the slain bodies, retreated again outside of rifle range, laid the bodies out, and formed a circle around them. They commenced howling and wailing in long wolf-like courses that echoed eerily off the surrounding hills. They then promptly loaded the bodies back onto the horses, firmly secured their goods, and, still wailing, rode over the foothills from which they had come. After waiting long enough to assure themselves that their attackers had gone for good this time, the mountain men made their way back to the campsite. Virtually everything of value had been taken, save for a bag of coffee beans that had been split open and scattered, and unbelievably, their dinner, which had been left roasting on the fire. Seeing nothing else to do, the men gathered up the coffee as best they could, ground it between rocks, and brewed up a pot of coffee with a pot that had not been taken. As they gathered around the fire to warm themselves and finally eat, one trapper remarked that he did not want to sit on the ground as it was too cold. So he, according to Rose, grabbed a Blackfoot by the heel and pulled him next to the fire, sat down on him, and ate his dinner. Such was the West. The men would make their way to the Gallatin River and within two days had joined up with another expedition, this time with the American Fur Company. And so the lives of the mountain men would go on. And this is but one story from Isaac P. Rose, but the rest of the tales in his book are other stories for other times. In 2015, The Revenant, starring Leonardo DiCaprio and directed by Alejandro G. Inaratu, was released to great critical acclaim and box office success. In 2016, the film would see great success at all major award shows, most notably netting three Academy Awards. But The Revenant lied, or at least wildly misled you. Hugh Glass was indeed a legendary mountain man, and he was indeed attacked by a grizzly and left for dead in 1823, and he did indeed complete a harrowing journey that deservedly has gone down in western lore as one of the all-time tales of survival. But he had no native wife, nor any native nor adopted children, and he did not exact revenge on the companions who left him, nor did his legendary career end where the movie does. Hugh Glass would ultimately forgive his betrayers and return to the unknown wilds he loved so dearly, and ultimately he would die a hard death at the hands of his enemies, many miles from all he knew and loved. Glass's biography is replete with obfuscation and confusion, with some evidence pointing to his being born in Pennsylvania and some pointing to him being born in Ireland. Either way, he is said to have taken to the high seas and served as a sailor and possibly a pirate for a time, ultimately jumping ship in the Gulf of Mexico to escape being the prisoner of the notorious pirate John Lafitte. He swam to shore in Texas and made his way north, ultimately signing on with the trapping expedition and beginning his career as a mountain man. He survived numerous attacks from native tribes, served alongside other legendary mountain men such as Jedediah Smith and William Ashley, to name just a few, and even penned a moving letter to a fellow trapper's family after the man passed away in a fight depicted between the Arikara and the mountain men in the opening scenes of the movie. After being mauled by the grizzly, Glass would indeed be abandoned by William Fitzpatrick and a teenage Jim Bridger. Glass would indeed essentially crawl hundreds of miles, surviving off of roots and buffalo carcasses to get to the nearest fort. He would then indeed pursue Bridger, but only to scare him and basically call him a little jerk. And Bridger would go on to be one of the most legendary mountain men of all time. Fitzpatrick had joined the army, and while Glass did indeed track him down in order to retrieve his rifle and money, which he was given, 
Fitzpatrick's commanding officer empathetically but emphatically informed Glass that he would not be able to offer him any further retribution, as now Fitzpatrick was property of the U.S. Army. So, there was no climactic encounter in which Glass and Fitzpatrick had a to-the-death knife fight until Glass could kill Fitzpatrick and thus secure his vengeance. It's an unfortunate liberty to take with this story to be sure, as it completely changes its trajectory from what it really was. Ultimately, it was a story of forgiveness and a moving on with one's life, and it was turned into a simple story of satisfying a lust for revenge. But I digress. The movie shows Glass enduring another attack or two, mostly at the hands of the Arikara, but in reality, he had signed on with another fur company, survived being attacked by another group of natives, been shot in the back with two arrows, and made another harrowing journey to return to the nearest fort, from which he recovered and managed to carry on again. He headed to Santa Fe, New Mexico, where the Gila River was proving to be a hot spot for trappers at the time. Hugh Glass returned to trapping, guiding, and serving as a hunter for the U.S. military commanders in the area who needed meat for their men. Glass proved to be quite adept as a scout and hunter for the U.S. Army outfits who were, by and large, hapless in this new territory that they had little to no first-hand knowledge of. Hugh signed on for a job as a hunter for Fort Cass, a fort near the junction of the Yellowstone River and the Bighorn Rivers. He worked through the winter, but in the early spring of 1833 decided it might be a good time to try trapping the Yellowstone River. Hugh and two of his trapper cohorts from the fort, a man named Hilone Leonard and a man named Colin Rose, headed out to head down the river. However, the river was still largely frozen and thus they had to make their way along the banks, looking for open spots to set their traps. They had not gone more than a few miles when they were ambushed from behind by a group of Arikaros. With no way to retreat away from the river, Glass, Leonard, and Rose quickly came to the sickening realization that the only possible direction in which to flee would be across the coverless expanse of the frozen river. They must have known their chances were next to non-existent, but all three chose to sell their lives as dearly as possible, doing their utmost to flee across the river. In what order they fell, we have no record. Whether they cried out in pain or died instantly, we will never know. But neither Hugh Glass nor his compatriots would make it across the frozen river on that chilly spring day. They would all be mutilated as a message to their friends that found them and scalped. It was noted that the Crow tribe, amongst whom Glass had spent much time and become very well acquainted, accompanied Beckworth on a burial detail his account, considered less than wholly reliable but not necessarily entirely apocryphal, is as follows. The crying was truly appalling. The three men were well known and highly esteemed by the crows. When their bodies were lowered to their last resting place, numberless fingers were voluntarily chopped off and thrown into the graves. Hair and trinkets of every description were also contributed, and the graves were finally filled up. A few weeks later, a group of trappers came across the group of Arikara who had attacked Glass and his comrades. This group of Arikara claimed to the trappers to be Crow, who the trappers were friendly with. But the trappers noticed that these Crow were in the possession of some of Glass's effects, namely his rifle and his knife. When they found out that this group were actually Arikara, masquerading as Crows, in order to evade the trouble from this much larger force of Glass's countrymen, they became enraged. Johnson Gardner, the leader of the party of trappers, had the Arikara present tied up, scalped alive, and then thrown into a fire to wriggle like worms until they expired in the flames. Weeks later, it must be noted, Gardner would suffer the same fate at the hands of avenging Arikaras. And so the West went, one giant cycle of lives lost and legends built, only to be forgotten again like so many winters past in this unforgiving land. Hugh Glass's life was indeed awe-inspiring and his legacy inarguable. What history remembers him for is a singular instance of his unimaginably staunch resolve to survive overwhelming circumstances that would have surely, and often did, doom lesser men. Glass would die as he lived, a man of action.
and while the stories of his exploits remain innumerable, those are stories for another time. May 1810. At their campsite on the shores of the Jefferson River, in what is today the state of Montana, a group of fur trappers readied themselves for their day's work of setting and checking traps. These men were among the first to venture into this territory, whose unrivaled beauty and bounty were constantly juxtaposed with the very real and very mortal threat of hostile tribes. They had come to this place so far away from their homes and families, which were, for many of them, hundreds or even thousands of miles away. Their universally shared goal was to acquire personal fortunes via trapping fever and use the money to improve their and their family stations in life. However, this is where a large part of the uniformity of the mountain man's experience ends. Trade, marriages, children, and cultural mixing resulted in a complex milieu of intercultural and intertribal relationships. Pragmatism was the order of the day, and economics the driving factor. The mountain men were traders and trappers, not settlers, and thus were not usually permanent residents of the lands that they traveled and worked. Many became deeply loyal to the tribes they were adopted into, and a sizable portion of their ranks included mixed-race individuals who were the products of marriages between white settlers and the indigenous local tribes. Perhaps none among this crew of trappers was as representative of the cultural coalescence that was all too common on the frontier, more so than the 36-year-old George Druyard. Born in 1773 in what is present-day old sandwich town Windsor, Ontario, to a French-Canadian father and a Shawnee mother, Druyard grew up on the frontier, learning the skills required of any good woodsman, from tracking to hunting and fishing and map-making. However, as his father was a commissioned captain in the British Army, having been recruited for his acuity as an interpreter of the Iroquois language for the British Indian Department, the young man also learned to read, write, and speak both French and English, as well as a number of native dialects, including Shawnee and Iroquois. He also became proficient in the common sign language ubiquitous, at least in some form or fashion, amongst the North American tribes. In 1803, he was recruited by Meriwether Lewis for what would become the legendary Voyage of Discovery in 1804, in which the exploratory party of Lewis and Clark made the first incursion into the High Plains, the Rockies, and ultimately, the Pacific Coast and back. Druyard had solidified his place in frontier lore with his participation in the expedition, and was viewed by many of the more neophyte trappers among this group with a sense of awe. He claimed that, being as he was half-native, he was as at home in the wilderness as any native in the territory, and thus, in fact, quite safe to roam about freely. However, even the rawest of the rookie trappers among them assumed Bruyard meant this, at least in part, as a tongue-in-cheek claim. For all among them were still painfully, palpably aware that they were still intruders in foreign lands. Their mere presence in tribal lands, uninvited and without permission, meant that they were subject to all the dangers that that might entail, including a violent death at the hands of tribes like the Cheyenne, the Arikara, the Comanche, and most prevalent and prominent in this area, the Blackfoot. The Blackfoot had long held martial sway over their Northern Plains brethren, being a warrior society whose existence hinged on the possession of the best available hunting grounds. They had proven nearly universally combative to all trespassers thus far, and there was no reason to think that they had changed tact. However, these dangers had been assumed by all in the party before they had headed out on the frontier in the first place. All present that brisk morning as the men gnawed down quick, cold breakfasts of jerky and pemmican, had decided that the risks of life as a trapper were still worth the potential rewards. They were all here to make money, and that was not often a proposition that could be accomplished without substantial risk. But. As with all prudent businessmen, assumed risk did not mean foolhardiness. Every morning in camp began with the men checking the proposed territory for the day with the officer in charge, then checking out the necessary gear from the quartermaster, all of which had to be meticulously recorded to be later scoured over by the accountants from their fur company financiers. Then, usually before dawn, the men would depart camps in groups of four. Each group would work their way up and down tributaries of whatever major river they were on, 
with two of them setting traps and keeping a watch out for attacks and hostile tribes. In general, this system provided enough security to keep the vast majority of the trappers alive. However, it did not often make them wealthy. This approach meant that the profit from every pelt collected by the group would have to be split four ways, in addition to the fur trading companies taking their piece of the proverbial pie. And so, while the physical security was most assuredly greatly appreciated, many found the practice financially stultifying and more than a little frustrating. Among these was George Druyard. With all his knowledge, experience, and what he believed to be the inherent omniscience provided by his bloodline, Druyard believed this practice was not only unnecessary, but an unacceptable financial drain on a trapper of his caliber. Druyard objected so strongly, in fact, that he had begun operating in open defiance of the established best practice of trapping in groups. For several days prior to this, he had finished his breakfast, mounted his horse, and deftly slipped off over the hills, alone but for his single-shot rifle, pistol, and tomahawk. To all present, this seemed to be, at least in some measure, a suicidal act. Those among them who have been so unlucky to find the bodies of their comrades, terribly mutilated and brutally killed, could not fathom how Druyard had rendered himself so secure in what seemed to be a mortally dangerous delusion. Again and again the veterans among them would beseech Druyard not to go out alone, but, much to their dismay, Druyard had not only gone out alone, but returned each day with a sizable harvest of beaver pelts. This not only increased his potential income, it exponentiated it. Other than the fur trading company's cut, Druyard would be pocketing 100% of the profit from each pelt, as opposed to the 25% the rest of his cohorts were used to. In very short order, Druyard had decided that giving up the level of profit increase for a measure of security that he found unnecessary was at once a wholly unacceptable proposition. And so, on this day, as his cohorts made their way up and downstream to begin their day's labor, George Druyard again bade them a jovial farewell and headed off over the hills alone. But that evening, as the men sat around their small fire, a pensive mood began to pervade amongst them. As each four-man group made their way back into camp, word went around that something was wrong. No one had seen George Druyard all day. However, nothing could be done in the dead of night, and so the men slept as best they could, before waking to another chilly riverside morning, still with no Druyard in sight. An air of dread hung over the camp, as the men discussed what might be done in hopes of finding, and aiding, the vaunted mountain men whom many had held in such high regard. In short order, a search party was sent out to comb the surrounding area. It would be only a matter of hours in which the less seasoned trappers waited nervously in the camp until the search party hurriedly returned, eyes wide, faces somber, and with horrifying news to report. They had indeed found George Druyard. He had been caught alone near a small creek by a group of Blackfoot. How many, they could not be sure, but from the number of arrows left at the scene, they assumed it to be several. To the best of the search party's estimation, Druyard had mounted his horse and ridden in small, feverish circles, firing off his rifle and then pistol as he whirled. He had then fought with knife and tomahawk, and from the amount of blood on the egress trail of the Blackfoot, had at least grievously wounded a few. However, his horse was ultimately shot, and Druyard was brought to the ground and drilled with arrows and lances. One can only imagine his regret as he spent his last moments writhing on the ground in territory he had been only moments before so safe and at home in. Once he was dead, or perhaps as he died, as was often the case in planes raiding and warfare, Druyard was disemboweled and his entrails scattered about the area. His hands and feet were then cut off and he was ultimately beheaded. His head was never found. Terrified at both the ghastly sight before them and the very real prospect of the same being wrought upon them, the search party hurriedly buried the legendary frontiersman in a shallow grave before making their way back to camp. The death of George Druyard was a pivotal moment in the history of the American mountain man. It illustrated that even the most vaunted and venerable amongst them was as vulnerable to the hand of fate as their neophyte brethren. Few mountain men would ever venture out alone 
again. But though the story of George Driard does end here, the story of the mountain men and the tribes they interacted with, both peaceably and otherwise, is replete with countless stories such as this one. But for now, those are other stories for other times. In 1809, on a chilly morning in southwestern Montana, two men quietly paddled their canoes down the Jefferson River. Their names were John Potts and John Coulter. Both had been members of the famed Lewis and Clark expedition and were some of the only non-natives on the continent familiar with this area. Their canoes were laden with beaver pelts, the reason for the joint business venture the two had launched the year before. The previous year, both men had come under attack while leading a contingent of natives from the Flathead and Creek tribes on a trapping expedition through the territory of their mortal enemies, the feared and venerable Blackfoot. Coulter, as a matter of fact, had suffered a leg wound in the attack, though it was not serious. Now, as the two men returned to Blackfoot country to again try their luck and ply their trade, the pair came around the bend to what must have been a truly horrifying sight. Hundreds of Blackfoot warriors were standing on the shoreline, and as the canoes pulled up even with them, they demanded the men come ashore. Immediately. Here, a critical choice was to be made by John Potts and John Coulter. Coulter decided to take his chances and comply, believing the Blackfoot wanted only to rob them of their pelts and supplies. A major inconvenience, but not necessarily a mortal one. Potts, meanwhile, decided he would not be making the trip ashore. He stayed put as Coulter paddled in. As soon as Coulter's canoe grounded on the bank of the river, he was pulled out, disarmed, stripped naked, and the bounty of his canoe was seized. Potts was again commanded to come ashore, but again steadfastly refused. As he refused, a Blackfoot stepped forward and shot him with a musket, putting a ball into Potts' hip. Potts took cover, ducking down low in his canoe, took aim, and fired back killing the brave who had shot him. Potts' canoe and body were then riddled with bullets and arrows from the hundreds of Blackfoot present, and his life was shortly snuffed out there on the cold river thousands of miles from his home. Potts' corpse and his canoe were then brought to shore, and as his goods were divvied up among the warriors, his body was hacked to pieces. His hands were cut off, his intestines were pulled out, his liver was pulled out, his testicles were cut off, and as each of these body parts were severed from their owner, the gore was rubbed in the naked and horrified John Coulter's face. Covered in the blood and entrails of his longtime friend and business partner, Coulter was sure he would be executed next. But a short meeting was held among the elder warriors present, and when they broke, Coulter was asked whether he was a good runner. Coulter, a tall, lean, and powerfully built man, was renowned for his endurance and strength. But, guessing the game that might be afoot, he replied that he was in fact a very poor runner. A Blackfoot chief walked Coulter away from the group, pointed towards the open territory heading away from the river, and said, Go. Coulter took off at top speed, hoping to get as much of a head start as possible. Soon, a large pack, different accounts set them from around a dozen to several dozen, began to chase after him, bows and spears in hand. After several miles of running at max effort through river-strewn, mountain-edged, and timber-spotted prairie, Coulter's nose began to bleed from the strain, and his entire torso became caked in both his blood and the dried and now likely quite pungent remains of John Potts. But his efforts had managed to put a large divide between him and nearly all of his pursuers. One warrior, though, had managed to hang in with Coulter through his entire flight so far, and was now closing ground at a deadly pace. However, he was so exhausted that he stumbled when he attempted to raise his spear to run Coulter through, and fell on his lance, accidentally breaking it into two pieces. Coulter grabbed the pointed end and stabbed the warrior to death with it, before taking off again after taking the now-dead Blackfoot's blanket. After another five miles, he came across a beaver dam in a river. He dove into the icy river, swam underneath the dam just like a beaver, and hid inside the dam until nightfall, all while the Blackfoot who had trailed him there went up and down the river trying to find him. 
When they eventually relented and left, Coulter emerged from the dam and walked, climbed, and crawled another 11 days to a trader's fort on the Little Bighorn River. He would recover from his ordeal, return again to the mountains, and try to build his own fort with new business partners. However, after going out to check their traps and returning to find that the Blackfoot had killed everyone in camp, 17 people, he fled the mountains for good, never to return. Coulter moved to Missouri, married, and died in 1815, though there is some debate to that, and the exact cause remains unknown. St. Louis, 1834. On a pleasant springtime morning, a group of 60 young men are busy readying themselves to head up the Missouri River. To a man, their goal in the ensuing months is to make as much money as possible. To do this, they have all signed on as hired hands to the fur expedition of one Mr. Wyeth, a Yankee entrepreneur that sought to solidify his own fortune via the accrual and sale of one of the most valuable resources on the North American continent at the time, beaver pelts. The parlors and cafes of such faraway locales as New York City, London, and Paris were full of men sporting one of the most defining fashion developments of the 19th century, the beaver felt top hat. This fashion craze caused the demand for beaver pelts to skyrocket and many young men to head west with intentions of securing their own fortunes. This group of prospective trappers, now gathered in St. Louis, are mostly in their late teens and early twenties, with many having made their way to the frontier port city from home states such as New York, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. Most were, to say the least, serviceable woodsmen, but few had ever ventured into the territory they were now about to. The nervous tension of youngsters on the brink of great adventure and great danger prevailed amongst them, as they were all too aware of the potential risks and rewards of their new endeavor. In the preceding weeks, as they had waited for the company of Mr. Wyeth to assemble and fully outfit itself, the neophyte frontiersmen had watched as many a keelboat had pulled into St. Louis bearing the fruits of their passengers' labors. Vast quantities of seemingly flawless beaver pelts were unloaded by weary but satisfied trappers, returning to sell their wares for profit and finally take their leave from the field. However, along with their encouraging bounties, the returning trappers also brought back with them no short supply of hair-raising stories about their run-ins with the tribes upon whose territories their trade required them to encroach. Oftentimes, trappers and frontiersmen were able to broker peaceable agreements with local tribes, with many becoming adopted into or intermarrying with a number of different tribes like the Crow, the Shoshone, and the Mandan. The Blackfoot, however, had proven perpetually combative and unreceptive to treaty, trade, or coexistence. The Blackfoot as a people are actually composed of four closely related bands. These are the Northern Pigan, the Southern Pigan, the Blood or Kaina, and the Siksika, often referred to as the Northern Blackfoot. Their reach by the early 19th century was vast, stretching from northern present-day Alberta, Canada, to southern Montana. They had originally come from the east, being one of the first Algonquin language-speaking tribes to migrate westward in order to hunt the vast herds of buffalo upon the open plains. Up until the early 18th century, they had subsisted by hunting the buffalo on foot. They would burn large swaths of prairie in predetermined locations, knowing the smoke and flames would cause whole herds of the lumbering beasts to panic and stampede, upon which they could be run off of cliffs where they would fall to their deaths. Sometime before 1750, however, the Blackfoot had acquired both horses and firearms, and they had used these new technologies to not only revolutionize their approach to hunting, but their approach to warfare. Now heavily armed and highly mobile, the Blackfoot waged merciless war on their longtime enemies like the Cree, the Crow, and the Kootenai. They saw the trapping expeditions who trapped and skinned the plentiful beavers from their lakes and streams and harvested and fed upon their deer, elk, and bear as no more than bald-faced intruders deserving of neither merit nor mercy. 
Many a young man newly arrived to St. Louis would find their taste for the freedom and adventure of the wild frontier suddenly soured upon hearing a returning trapper recount tales of finding good friends and comrades' bodies, terribly mutilated and full of so many arrows they resembled dead porcupines. But, despite all of the dangers, or maybe because of them, the prevailing mood on this morning is one of joviality and optimism. As the young men stand around in small groups, seeking shade as the sun begins its climb to its noontime apex, they trade stories of wild nights on the town, boast of great deeds yet undone, and rib each other with jokes. One among them, though, is notably less enthusiastic. Though outwardly looking as fit for the job as any of his cohorts to his left and right, a young man, known only to history as Howell, takes little to no part in the fun. He has, in fact, proven so sullen and melancholy over the last few days, many of the others wonder if he will even board the boat heading west on the Missouri, or whether he will head back home, wherever that might be. His perceived weakness draws the ire of his companions, as is wont to happen in groups of men such as this, when it is seen as more of a merciful fate for all involved to run the weak member out, lest he become a liability for all at some later date in some far less hospitable locale. Howell himself wonders what he will do when the boat scheduled to take them upstream arrives. He had eaten little in the past few days, and slept even less. This combination serves only to fray his already strained nerves even further, as his mind drifts and his resolve continues to waver. Time, however, waits for no one, and before noon, the boat has docked only yards away from where the men of the company are waiting. The next few hours are spent loading the men, livestock, and material meant to sustain them for several months onto the boat. Finally, with all sixty of the men, including Howell, plus the crew and Mr. Wyeth aboard, the keelboat departs St. Louis, heading up the river towards the frontier. After a few days' travel on the river, the company pulls ashore to make camp. After securing the livestock and eating a much-anticipated supper, the trappers convene in small circles around several small campfires. As each group settles in about the fire, conversation is made about the day's events and expectations of what is to come. Still, Howell remains as distant and melancholy as ever. His compatriots, not lacking entirely in basic empathy, at least not yet, inquire as to what the cause of Howell's seemingly incessant internal turmoil might be. Howell, exhausted by the physical and psychological toll of the day, confesses almost immediately, with equal parts relief and anxiety, that the source of his trouble is the ceaseless worry and heart sickness caused by the beautiful young woman he had left behind. The following is an excerpt from Four Years in the Rockies by James P. Marsh, link to purchase in the description. Well, boys, Howell said, I suppose you think it's strange that I should always be so gloomy, but I have good reasons for being so. I believe I am today the most unlucky man in the world. Listen, and you can judge for yourselves. I was engaged to be married to one of the nicest girls in St. Louis, and she was just as good as she was good-looking. She was a seamstress and supported herself and her aged mother by sewing for a clothing store. We were engaged last spring and were to marry in the fall, and in the meantime I was to save up enough money to buy a wagon and a team and go hauling. Well, boys, I shipped on board a steamboat as a deckhand at $30 a month, and I afterwards become a fireman for which I received $40 a month. I was saving and by the middle of September had $200 with which I started up to St. Louis. Near Memphis, our boat blew up. There were a great many killed and scalded. I was knocked overboard and picked up in an insensible condition. When I came to, I found myself in bed. My money was gone and I never heard of it again and I went back to St. Louis poorer than when I left. My girl received me kindly and bade me of good cheer, but our wedding was postponed till spring, and I hired with a tanner in St. Charles at $25 a month. I understood the business and made a good deal by working extra time, and by February I had a hundred extra dollars saved, which I left in the hands of my employer. Well, gentlemen, 
One night the whole concern burned down, and as there was no insurance, my boss was a ruined man, and so was I. And having now lost all heart, contrary to the wishes of my girl, I joined Wyeth's company, and here I am. Yes, and you have me to thank for it, chided a man in the company known only as Smith, whom Mr. Wyatt had bailed out of jail with a promise to the local sheriff that his employment would prevent any further rabble-rousing in his town. Smith, a callous and uncaring man by all accounts, then recalled in front of all at the campfire how Howell had attempted to take his traps and desert when the boat had docked briefly in St. Charles. Just before reaching St. Charles, Howell had concluded that he would not, or could not, continue on the trip and determined to head back to St. Louis. He had quietly gathered his traps and, in a moment when all of the rest of the crew were busy on board or engaged elsewhere, attempted to slip off the boat and into the small crowd, leaving no one the wiser as to his whereabouts. However, Smith had spotted Howell packing his things and knew the obvious cause was that of his great anxiety to return to his bride-to-be. Disgusted, Smith berated Howell with insults, telling him not to be such a love-sick baby and to remember the agreement that he had made with the company, one which he was honor-bound as a man, to uphold. For a few minutes, Smith and Howell argued in hushed tones, with each becoming more vehement in their position. Finally, just as the boat began to pull away from the shore, Howell jumped off the vessel and onto the shore, determined to make his escape. Smith demanded the keelboat pilot return the vessel to the banks of the river, so that he might retrieve Powell. At first, the pilot refused. But he was quickly persuaded when Smith pulled out a revolver and stuck it against the pilot's head. Smith demanded the boat be brought to shore immediately, or he would dispatch the pilot right here and now. As the boat pulled close enough to shore, Smith jumped off, promptly walked up to Howell, grabbed him by the arm and forcibly dragged him back to the boat, all while verbally shaming him for his lapse in manly virtue. Devastated and terrified, Howell now saw that his fate was sealed, and ever since, he had spent every night tossing and turning at the prospect that he might now never see his beloved again. Now, as the flickering campfire illuminated Howell's forlorn and desperate expression, one of the few older men in the company, a man named Green, seeking to show at least some measure of commiseration with the poor young man, smiles knowingly and reaches into his pocket, from which he procures a piece of hammered gold, again quoting from four years in the Rockies. Do you see that, boys? said Green. That's what started me for the Rockies. That was once an engagement ring. Yes, boys, it's a fact. I was once engaged to be married, and the gal was pretty as a peach and spry as a bird, and she thought a heap of me, she did. But I, like a darn fool, got on her bender for three or four days, and when she heard on it, she sent me back this ring. Well, boys, I took it and hammered it out the way you see it now. Wyeth was just getting up his company at that time, and so I joined. Another trapper by the name of Rube, now moved by the other's stories and seeking to both share in his cohort's burden and relieve himself of his own, spontaneously chimes in with his own story. See here, boys. You seem to all be in for telling what started you to the Rockies. Now, what do you suppose started me? Now, you can believe it or believe it not, just as you please, but honest engine, it were a cussed old mule. Though, mind you, there were a gal involved, too. You may talk about your pretty gals and your spry gals. There weren't a patchin' in Selena Perkins. She weighed 160 pounds and had a face on her around like a full moon. She was a rouser, she was. Well, we were engaged to be married, and I were to run her daddy's farm, which were about nine miles from St. Louis. This day afore the wedding, I went into town to buy a critter and fell in with some of my old pards, who were out of the Rockies with me the year before. Well, I began to feel like taking another trip, but I couldn't see how this thing was to be did. There were the gal, and the wedding were to come off the next night, so I thought I'd take a night to consider on it. The next morning I bought a mule I had been looking at the day before, and after running around with the boys all day, towards night I started for home, and would you believe it, I hadn't made up my mind whether to marry or to start for the Rockies. The company would be off the next morning, and as I rid along on the mule I kept studying but I couldn't come to no conclusion. About eight miles from St. Louis, the roads forked, 
One road led to my gals and t'other to town. Just before I reached the forks, a happy idea struck me. By thunder, says I, I'll leave it to the mule. If she takes the right-handed road, it's Mary. If she takes the left, it's the Rockies. So I dropped the bridle into her neck, stuck my hands into my pockets, and said, Go it, Bets, for that were her name. Well, boys, she took the left, and here I am. I writ Selena a letter telling her to hold on faithful for two years. I'd be on them with pockets full of dollars, and we'd hitch for sure and certain without fail. For a brief moment, the all-too-rare compassion of his fellow trappers gives Howell a much-needed measure of relief. He realizes he is not alone in his suffering, and he is with friends. Howell takes heart in this, thinking maybe things are not so bad after all. He sleeps peacefully for the first time in many days. Then, the next morning, the call goes out to load up, for the company is taking the boat to its final point, as far into the frontier as they can be taken with some relative measure of safety. Now, a cold chill goes down Howell's spine, as he is reminded that they are headed into dangerous territory, ruled over by dangerous tribes who had no interest in extending compassion of any kind. The Blackfoot do not care about Howell's homesickness, nor his heartache, nor that of any of his cohorts. They do not care why these men have come to their lands, only that they are here, and that they are trespassing. However, despite the hazards of their endeavor, there is still much work for the trappers to do. The company departs the relative safety of the Missouri River and makes their way onto the prairies and foothills. For weeks, they work from stream to stream, river to river, going out in small groups in the early morning to set traps and returning to check on them periodically throughout the next few days. Though many meet with initial success, they are also quickly fatigued by the incessant danger and intermittent attacks of the Blackfoot. The trappers play an ongoing game of chance, in which they must balance risk and reward every day, constantly evaluating and recalculating their odds and decisions. The more trappers that went out in a group, the more protection could be afforded against Blackfoot attacks. However, this also meant the bounty of pelts would have to be divvied up into smaller shares. This could net the trapper such little gain for such risk that risking a little more to gain a little more could fast become an enticing prospect. It was this ongoing gamble that eventually begins to play on the mind of Howell. Over the ensuing weeks, he and his companions have worked hard and endured much privation and danger. They have also, they are now confident, learned how to stay alive in harsh territory. Now, many of them see that they can perhaps count on their newfound sense of self-sufficiency to garner them the fortunes that they seek. Howell decides the risk is worth the reward, as does Green, the man who carries the piece of gold in his pocket. When the company reaches the area of the Yellowstone River, two men set out down its banks intending to set traps for the next few miles. All seems well as the country is beautiful, the day is warm, and signs of beaver in the area are plentiful. For a brief moment, perhaps it seems to both men as if things are not so bad out here on the frontier. Perhaps they had done the right thing in coming out here, and that perhaps someday in the not-too-distant future, they would recall this scene and so many scenes like it to the adoring wonder of their wives and children. Then, suddenly, as the men ride placidly up the banks of the river, a party of six to eight Blackfoot appear from around a bend, and all thoughts of love and legacy vanish for both men, now replaced with cold, sheer terror. The pair wheel their horses around and start into a full gallop headed back towards the company's camp. Then, to their horror, they see another group of Blackfoot coming towards them from where they had just ridden. Now, their only option to escape certain death is to make it to the other side of the Yellowstone River and hopefully outride their pursuers before they can cross the river themselves. With seconds to spare until the Blackfoot are upon them, the two desperate men lean back until their shoulders nearly touch the canters of their saddles as their mounts make the near vertical descent down the river banks into the water. As they do this, war cries from the Blackfoot fill the air, as do arrows from every bow present. As the trapper's horses hit the water, Green slides out of his saddle and swims alongside his horse, 
using the animal as a shield against the Blackfoot projectiles that rained down all around them. Owl, however, due either to inexperience, panic, or both, stays in his saddle, attempting to ride straight across and up the other bank. This is a fatal error. Before either trapper can make it to the opposite bank, Howell is struck three times in the back. Just as their horses begin to find their footing on the opposite bank, he gives a loud, piteous moan and falls forward onto the neck of his mount, dropping his rifle into the water. Are you badly hurt? cries Green, over the din of Blackfoot celebrations at falling one of their hated intruders. I'm a dead man, Howell says, and you had better leave me and do the best you can to save yourself. Green, to his eternal credit, decries this as an untenable option. He will not, he says, leave Howell to die so long as there is any hope of saving him. Green takes Howell's horse by the bridle, coaxing the animal up the embankment as the arrows continue to fly, and Howell continues to moan and hang on with all of his might. Once they reach the top of the bank, Green tells Howell to bear down as he leads both horses as fast as possible in the direction of the camp. However, they are now on the opposite side of the river from the camp. Though they have secured some measure of a lead over their pursuers, they must again cross the river. They find a marshy area about a mile away from the camp that looks as though it might be fordable before the Blackfoot can reach them, and the men and horses plunge headlong into it in desperate flight. It is here that Howell, unable to hang on any longer, falls from his mount. Green sees he does not have time to load his direly wounded companion onto his own horse, nor can he mount any consequential resistance to the Blackfoot on his own. Thus, he rides for the camp at full speed, alerting his comrades as to the state and location of the fallen Howell. A group of trappers return with him at once and manage to load their suffering cohort onto another horse, all while amassing fire at the Blackfoot. They ride hard and fast back into camp, and Howell is laid out and made as comfortable as possible. But nothing can be done for the man. Howell writhes and wheezes for an unbearably long time. Finally, the unfortunate young man, along with all of his hopes for love and longevity, dies a cold, lonely death many miles from anything and anyone he truly loves. For all the vaunted talk of adventure and fortune, this is the stark reality of the frontier. Hal will be buried where he dies, and once the initial waves of horror and grief pass over the men in camp, a veil of rage descends upon them. Though the story of Howell will end here, the trappers present will go on to mount a revenge raid against the Blackfoot. It will be an attack the Blackfoot will never forget. But for now, that is another story for another time. Montana, 1836. In the middle of the night, in the dead of winter, a fur trapper named Isaac P. Rose shakes himself free from the warmth of the buffalo robe he has been sleeping in and rises to his feet. In a daze, the man wanders into the freezing, ominous darkness of the woods that surround him and his companion's small campsite. He trudges to a spot a few dozen yards away, feeling inexplicably drawn to a small clearing just beyond the tree line. As he comes into view of the clearing, he is shocked to see the hulking figure of a lone grizzly bear. For the veteran mountain man, the sight of a grizzly here in the wilds near Clark's Fork on the Yellowstone River is not at all unusual. However, this grizzly is standing on his hind legs, nearly eight feet tall, and staring intently at the bewildered man. Locking eyes with Rose, the bear walks up to the man, striding in an eerily human-like gait, and speaks. He tells Rose, in a deep, steady voice to shake his hand. Rose, more confused than afraid, offers the hulking beast his left hand. The bear refuses to take it. Rose, sensing the animal's offense, hurriedly extends his right hand instead. At this, the bear silently and solemnly shakes the man's hand with both of its massive paws. Then, the bear suddenly disappears with a gust of icy wind. Just as suddenly, Rose finds himself awakened by the morning sun, still wrapped in the warm buffalo blanket. It had all, of course, been a dream. Rose and his fellow mountain men, party composed of himself, as well as Joe Meek, 
Jack Larison and Mark Head have departed from their main company in order to procure meat for their starving comrades. The main party, under the leadership of the legendary mountain man Jim Bridger, are camped 30 miles away. They are counting on their comrades to ease the troublesome burden of surviving the harsh winter at hand. They have thus far been successful, as they have managed to kill so many buffalo that, after one day's hunt, four of the eight horses that have been brought along to pack the meat now find themselves burdened by full loads. The snow is deep, and travel has been slow. With another long, cold day ahead of them, the fur trappers begin to pack their things and make ready for travel. As they do this, Rose recounts his strange dream for his companions, partly for their amusement, and partly hoping one of them might proffer an explanation as to the meaning of it. He tells them how Caleb, the colloquial name amongst mountain men for the grizzly bear, had come to him in a dream, that he had spoken and only shaken his right hand. Joe Meek, another veteran trapper, shakes his head and lowers his concerned eyes on Rose. You had better look out, Rose, or you'll shake hands with Beelzebub before night. While the grizzly bear certainly instills a healthy sense of respect and fear in any mountain man, what they fear most is coming into contact with Beelzebub. Though his name is used in the New Testament as a synonym for the devil, that is not the image that comes to the typical trapper's mind when they hear the word. For these men, the most fearful entity that they might encounter here in the wilds thousands of miles from their places of birth is not the grizzly, nor is it the venomous snakes buffalo stampedes, wolves, mountain lions, flash floods, avalanches, or wildfires. For the mountain men, their greatest fear is the Blackfoot. The Blackfoot, or Siksika, had originated in the northeast, near the area between the modern-day state of Maine and Canada. They would eventually make their way to the Great Lakes region and then even further west onto the expanses of the Great Plains of present-day Alberta, Canada, and the state of Montana. They had subsisted in these unforgiving environs for centuries as foot-bound hunters. Before the introduction of the horse into the Blackfoot culture in the 18th century, they had survived by chasing bison herds off of cliffs, gathering at the bottom to butcher the animals. Their cultural transformation to a horse-based people who hunted, conducted warfare, and traveled on horseback was delayed far longer than the tribes further to the south. This was due more to geography than anything else, as the Blackfoot's northerly location placed them farther away from the large populations of horses found in Mexico and Texas. But, however delayed their transformation might have been, it has also been incredibly rapid and incredibly consequential on the northern plains. The Blackfoot had quickly mastered hunting and fighting from atop charging mounts and had proven the most formidable power in the area for decades by the time Isaac Rose and his comrades sauntered into their territory in the 1830s. During the winter months, which could amount to more than half the year in these northernmost reaches of the Great Plains, the Blackfoot would set up their villages in the wooded river valleys. On the rare occasion that they ventured out from these quarters, it was generally to partake in the same practice that Rose and his companions were partaking in. They would hunt the buffalo herds that hunkered down in the wooded areas and harvest as many as they could carry back in order to sustain their families and community until the long-awaited end of winter. The buffalo was more than simply a main food source of the Blackfoot. For the Blackfoot, nearly every tool and furnishing at their disposal came, in some form or fashion, from the buffalo. Properly known as the American bison or Plains bison, they are the largest land animal on the North American continent. The largest males can weigh upwards of 2,000 pounds and can be incredibly unpredictable. They roam virtually the entirety of the middle of the continent, from northern Canada to Mexico, in what is known as the Bison Belt. At their peak, most experts estimate their population to range from 30 to 50 million, with some estimates being as high as 75 million. Their thick hides provide the material with which the Blackfoot and other plains tribes construct their teepees. Their bones, hooves, and horns are used to construct tools and cooking utensils. Bison meat is, of course, the basis of the Blackfoot diet. Roasted, fried, boiled, dried, or raw, it could be prepared and consumed in a variety of manners. 
a particular delicacy for many plains tribes, was to squirt the bile from the gallbladder into the cavernous open stomach of a freshly killed lactating female buffalo. This created a yogurt of sorts that many children saw as a treat. To the Blackfoot, the buffalo are a sacred gift from their creator, their way of life, and their livelihood. As such, they see fit to protect their resources by any means necessary. Since the buffalo herds are such an important resource for the Blackfoot, any incursion into their territory, and especially any hunting of the buffalo on that territory, is seen as an offense punishable by death. Hugh Monroe, a Canadian fur trapper who was adopted into the Blackfoot, gives his account of how viciously the Blackfoot dealt with intruders, even of other native tribes. After finding a still smoldering campfire of a neighboring tribe referred to as the River People, the Blackfoot whom Monroe was living with became inconsolably irate and set on revenge. He asked one warrior, a man named Lone Walker, what had happened. Monroe's account is as follows. The campers here were the river people, said Lone Walker. We had forbidden them to come over here on our plains, but they keep coming and stealing our buffaloes. We shall now make them cry. You are going to fight them? asked Monroe. Yes, said Lone Walker. I shivered, recalls Monroe. In my mind's eye, I saw a great battle, arrows flying and guns booming, and men falling and crying out in their death and agony. And for what? Just a few buffaloes that blackened the plains. Don't fight, pleaded Monroe. There are plenty of buffalo. Let the river people go in peace with what they have killed. But, the Canadian recalled, he gave me no answer other than a grim smile and rode out to meet the head of the Blackfoot call. In the ensuing fight, the Blackfoot would kill seven of the river people's warriors as their women and children fled in desperate panic. All seven would be scalped and otherwise mutilated as both punishment and warning. Afterwards, a great celebration would be held. The fur trappers are well aware of the danger their venture has placed them in. However, they are also aware that the buffalo meat they return to their company with could quite literally be the difference between a relatively comfortable winter and possibly starving to death in the middle of nowhere. And so, for the time being, they are not dissuaded from their job at hand. The four men continue on with their day, spending it much the same as they had the day before. Rose, the most reliable shot, would fall a buffalo, and then they would all set into quartering and packing the meat. However, after seeing several hundred of the animals, they have proven so unusually skittish that Rose could not get close enough for a good shot. This suspicious behavior spells only one sure thing, according to the mountain man's instincts, that the Blackfoot are nearby. The trappers agree that the best course of action is to return to camp with the buffalo meat they have been able to procure so far. They head southeast through rolling hills. As the men ride, conversation is kept to a minimum, and their eyes continually scan the landscape around them. They are well aware that being caught with a bounty of buffalo meat will likely spell a torturous end at the hands of the Blackfoot. This end could certainly come by a variety of tortures routinely employed by almost all Plains tribes. These include being staked out in the summer sun, burned under red-hot coals, or quite literally being carved to pieces as their torturers, along with the women and children, laugh at and chide them. But a hard death could also, as Isaac Rose and company had found out only a few weeks earlier, be suffered even after escaping from a Blackfoot attack. A Delaware tribesman named Manhead, who had been traveling with the fur company, had been out hunting with Rose when the pair were suddenly attacked by a small group of Blackfoot warriors. Rose and Manhead had managed to make it back to camp, with Manhead suffering only a flesh wound from a bullet in his calf. But as they reached camp, Manhead informed Rose that he had been hit with a dreaded poison bullet, and his demise was all but certain. Over the succeeding hours, the unfortunate Delaware would suffer an agonizing death. In his biographical work on Isaac Rose titled Four Years in the Rockies, author James B. Marsh addresses the reader directly and how these poison bullets were made. Perhaps our readers may not be aware of the method resorted to by the Indians in poisoning their bullets. It is done this way. A small piece of buffalo meat is placed on the end of a forked stick, and a rattlesnake 
is induced to strike his fangs into it. This poisoned meat is then dried, pounded into a powder, and placed in a small bag. When the Indian intends to use one of these poisoned bullets, he first puts it in his mouth and chews it for some time, then dips it into the bag, and the slightest wounds from one of these bullets can cause death. As the trappers try to push these fears from their minds and focus on the task at hand, they feel an inexorable tension as the undulating terrain provides ample cover for a Blackfoot ambush. All they can hope for now is to make it back to their company's main camp and the comparative safety and numbers it provides. After a few hours of riding, it seems as though they might actually make it. Then, just as they are about to reach a small ravine, a party of eight Blackfoot spring up, screaming their defiant, powerful war cries. The lead Blackfoot warrior is scarcely ten feet from Rose when the attack begins. Rose, in the lead, wheels his horse and is now the closest target for the Blackfoot to attack. Almost as suddenly as he can turn his horse to flee, the air is filled with the roar of gunfire and Blackfoot musket balls whiz all around him. One of the balls passes through his cap while another rips across his chest, leaving a jagged but shallow cut across his skin and cutting the strings of his shot pouch, causing the critical piece of weaponry to fall to the ground. Another ball passes through the wrist of his buckskin glove, again miraculously only causing minor superficial damage to his wrist. Rose's most grievous wound comes when one of the lead balls smashes into his right elbow. The ball enters just above the joint and exits through the forearm, rendering the limb all but useless for the time being. The Blackfoot warrior nearest Rose, seeing he is now incapacitated, rides forward to finish the attack. The warrior attempts to grab Rose's horse by its bridle with one hand while attempting to shove Rose from the animal. Rose uses his severely injured right hand to hang on to the reins while he repeatedly strikes the Blackfoot warrior in the face with his riding whip. As he does this, Rose's horse panics and lurches away from the Blackfoot taking off in a dead run in the direction of the other trappers. This is a fortuitous break for Rose, however, as the horse wheels around to make their escape, Rose's rifle falls from his lap. Rose realizes he is severely wounded, and now without any means of defense save for his hunting knife and tomahawk. His only hope is to hang on as his horse makes a mad dash away from the Blackfoot. He urges the animal onward, doing all he can to hang on to the reins with his one working arm. Looking behind him, he sees the Blackfoot warrior closest in pursuit stop to pick up Rose's valuable rifle from the ground, fumbling with the rifle's leather scabbard. Rose again turns his gaze forward, hunkering down as low as possible next to the horse's neck. Then he hears a sound he is well familiar with, the crack of his own rifle, followed by the sound of yet another ball whizzing by his head. Rose's charging steed manages to catch up to the party of three other trappers whose retreat has been slowed by their heavily burdened pack animals. Seeing no better option, Jack Larison cuts the straps holding the loads to the animals, leaving hundreds of pounds of meat spilling upon the rolling prairie. Larison calls out to Rose, Are you killed, old boy? Not killed, but badly wounded, Rose replies. Hurry forward, boys, and save yourselves if you can. Rose and his cohorts must now cover over 30 miles of prairie in order to get back to the safety of their company. In another fortuitous break for the party, the Blackfoot have halted their pursuit in order to reclaim the buffalo meat dropped by the trappers. Though they are now empty-handed, they are all alive. Rose, however, is beginning to rapidly decline over the course of the ride. His arm throbs in immense pain, and he is wrought with nausea and dizziness. For hours, he rides through icy winds and over snow-covered grounds, his right arm dangling uselessly by his side. It is soon apparent that at least one of his wounds is the result of a poisoned bullet. As the four trappers finally reach camp, it is readily apparent to all that Rose is on the verge of death. He is pulled off of his horse and carried into a tent, where Jim Bridger and a Delaware medicine man examine him. Both concur that he is the victim of a poisoned bullet and has likely only survived this long due to the blood loss he had incurred during his ride. Over the next few days, Rose lies in the tent battling for his life against the effects of the poison and blood loss. His arm swells to a nearly unrecognizable mass, causing fissures in the skin at the shoulder. 
his nervous system becomes, in his own later words, fearfully disorganized, and even the slightest noise, light, or motion causes him great distress. His fellow trappers do all within their power to care for him, though little can be done other than keeping the wound clean and letting the man sleep as best he can. Most of his friends fear, if not outright assume, he will not survive long. However, after about a week, the wound has begun to heal. Soon, Rose is able to eat and walk, and within weeks, he will be back to work, hunting and trapping. However, Rose will scarcely have regained the ability to hold down food by the time an injured scout limps into camp, seemingly in a full froth panic. The scout, a Mexican man known as Masayeno, has been shot in the ankle, though thankfully not by a poison bullet, and had only escaped certain death at the hands of a roving band of Blackfoot by hurling himself off of a steep cliff which they were not willing to follow him down. Asayeno reports that the Blackfoot are coalescing in a winter camp on the Yellowstone River, four miles south of the trapper's location. The village is nearly a thousand lodges strong, he says, and when they discover the trapper's location, the trappers will surely be wiped out. And so, the fight for the frontier will continue. Bridger will order his men to construct a makeshift fort, and the men will hunker down for what will be one of the most brutal encounters between native tribes and mountain men in the history of the Old West. But for tonight, the accounts of that battle, as well as the countless other tales of conflict and coexistence between tribespeople and trappers, are other stories for other times. May 1823, in the territory of what is now South Dakota, on the vast expanse of the undulating prairie that extended to the horizon in every direction, a contingent of mules, horses, and men moved warily next to a river, with pensive eyes switching from the water to the surrounding landscape, searching for signs of danger. They were hundreds of miles from anything resembling a city, in a territory that did not belong to them. They were a mix of men from a plethora of backgrounds, dressed in wool shirts, buckskin leggings, boots, moccasins, serapes, raccoon skin caps, flat brimmed hats, and belts. Their common goal, put simply, was money. Money by way of accumulating and selling beaver pelts, the coveted material that made the popular top hats of the day worn throughout New York, Paris, and London. The means were simple, set traps for the beavers, the animals would become ensnared in the traps and drown, they would collect the beaver pelts and repeat this process until it became hard to find beaver. Then they would move on. Simple. But simple does not always equal easy. Opposing them were the elements, from blazing heat to icy cold, from snow to dust storms, from droughts to flash flooding. Hostile native tribes like the Blackfoot, Arikara, and Comanche killed many in gruesome ways for violating their tribal territory bounds. Among this party of men were some who would go on to become legends in the annals of mountain man history. They were commanded by General William H. Ashley and Major Andrew Henry, and among their ranks were Hugh Glass and Jedediah Smith, two men whose future exploits would become the stuff of mountain man legend. Smith was an anomaly amongst an already anomalous lot, as he was a devout Methodist, read the Bible daily, refrained from coarse language, as well as dalliances with unknown women and strong drink. On this day, he was approached by Major Henry and directed to ride south to General Ashley's fort, known aptly as Fort Ashley. He was to inform General Ashley that the company was in need of more horses and that the Arikara tribe would likely be the closest to trade with in horse flesh. Jedediah Smith was still a relative neophyte in the world of fur trapping, but was a man on the rise within the ranks of his company as his reputation as a stalwart and trustworthy hand was growing. So Smith set out south, and was actually met by Ashley coming north at the Arikara village where they sought to buy more horses. In terms of business, this appeared quite fortuitous for the trappers. The Arikara 
a Northern Plains semi-agricultural tribe known for both their prowess in trade and warfare, whose ire had been stirred by some recent bad dealings with other white traders, were in a less than cordial mood. However, Ashley and his men had guns and ammunition that the Arikara knew they could acquire through few, if any, other sources. Thus, there was a terse and tense peace, as often happened in these instances. Tribes and trappers were not necessarily antagonistic, in fact, quite the opposite. Fur companies routinely employed native persons as translators, trackers, and trappers, as well as brokered many trading deals with tribes from New York to Oregon. Even in the early 19th century, in the middle of the plains, no culture existed in a vacuum. From the armchair of posterity, we were often inclined to view the cultural landscape at the time as a binary us versus them, or natives versus Americans paradigm. This was not only not true then, but it had not been the case for centuries. Tribes had warred and traded with each other for eons before the arrival of any European and the introduction of the Spanish, French, English, Canadians, and Americans did not stop this, but only incorporated them into the complex and ever-evolving milieu of the New World. So, some initial dealings were made between the two parties, and it was mutually agreed upon that the trading would continue the next day. Ashley split his forces into one on land to guard the supplies, and two in the two boats which were anchored about 30 yards off the banks of the river. Ashley would be in direct command of the boats, and Jedediah Smith would be in charge of the force on land. Nearly all of the mountain men present went about their nightly routine of making dinner, cleaning their weapons, checking their supplies, and preparing for the next day's travel and trading. But when all had bedded down for the night, Two men from the mountain men's party snuck into the Rikara camp with whiskey and trinkets that they hoped to trade for sexual favors from the Rikara women. This would prove to be a fatal mistake. But just as the braves made it to the shore and the sound of sloshing water from their swim strokes had abated, they were replaced by the frantic screams of the two mountain men who had snuck into the Rikara camp. These men had indeed found the Rikara women that they were hoping to but they had also found Arikawa men who were not too happy with the presence of intruders attempting to defile their wives, daughters, and sisters. One had been cut down in the camp, and another, Edward Rose, had escaped and now appeared on the banks of the river, making his way as fast as he could for Jedediah Smith's party. He screamed that his partner in mischief, a man named Aaron Stevens, was dead and the Arikara were now in a collectively combative mood. Still cloaked in pre-dawn darkness and alerted to both the attempted robbery of Ashley's boat and the killing of their comrade in the camp by the now presumably enraged Arikara, the mountain men began to vociferously debate their options. Some argued for immediately moving the horses they had, a sizable herd by this point, to the opposite shore before daybreak, so that they might be in a better position to flee when the sun came up with at least the river between them and the expected Arikara attack. Others argued for the retrieval of Stephen's body. As these debates carried on, a lone Arikara appeared on the horizon above the riverbanks. Still in the dark, he called out that he would try to broker a deal to get them Stephen's body back for the price of one of their best horses. The mountain men agreed to this, but a short time later, the enterprising Arikara returned to inform them that, unfortunately, he would not be able to uphold his end of the deal. Stevens' body had been so badly mutilated, he said, that there was nothing substantive for him to bring back to them. This, understandably, sent a cold chill through the ranks of the party. It was decided that they would now have to move the horses as soon as possible, as the sunrise neared with every passing minute. Remaining calm and cool by all accounts, Jed Smith embraced his first real opportunity at leadership and calmly directed the movement of the horses to and then across the river. However, as the sun began to rise, and a large number of horses and men were still mid-river or near the bank waiting for their turn to move, the mountain men were greeted with a horrifying sight. Silhouetted in the new morning sunlight were hundreds of Arikara warriors, tamping down shot into their muskets, knocking their arrows, and taking up offensive positions.
The full gravity of the situation hit everyone present, seemingly instantly and seemingly simultaneously. They were stuck, with the enemy having the high ground and no cover to be found. At this point, fish in a barrel might not have been an adequate descriptor of the position of the men present in the shore party. Within moments, musket balls, spears, and arrows began to rain down on them from above. Dozens of horses and a few men fell dead in the initial volley, with many others gravely wounded. The screams of injured and dying horses and men filled the air, as Ashley and the men in the boats attempted to meet them on the other shore and make their getaway. The boats provided what covering fire they could, and the men on shore took cover behind the bodies of the dead horses. From here, as chaos reigned all around, Jed Smith coolly and calmly doled out directions to those in charge. As he and his men fired and reloaded, they made strategic retreats, making their way via leapfrogging one defensive position at a time to the comparative cover and safety of the boats. In all of this, Ashley's boat had run aground momentarily on a sandbar. The other boat, at around this time, cut the tie to their anchor and began moving downstream in an attempt to save at least themselves from this seemingly helpless situation. Ashley's boat was quickly freed and made its way as close to the shore as possible. Jed Smith and his men finally reached the banks of the river. They dove in and began to frantically swim. Some were hit by arrows and some by musket balls, and they sank under the surface, never to be seen again. Some were swept down the river, beyond the extended oars and hands of their comrades, also never to be seen again. The lucky few who managed to make it to the boats, including Jed Smith and Hugh Glass, hunkered down and returned fire as the boats made their way as fast as possible down the Missouri River and out of the Arikara musket and arrow range. For some of these men, this would be enough to end their mountain man adventures. Those who had decided that they had seen enough of this wild and dangerous life were put on a boat back to St. Louis along with their injured and recovering companions. No one could blame them, and no one did, for preferring the comforts of home to this lonely land where life was short and seemingly cheap. However, Colonel Ashley, Hugh Glass, and Jedediah Smith were not done. Ashley would go on to mount retributive efforts with the U.S. Army, and Hugh Glass would go on to pen a heart-wrenching letter to the family of John Gardner, a mountain man who had been killed in the Arikara fight. The following is that letter. Dear Sir, My painful duty is to tell you of the death of your son who befell at the hands of the Indians 2nd June in the early morning. He lived little while after he was shot and asked me to inform you of his sad fate. We brought him to the ship where he soon died. Mr. Smith, a young man of our company, made a powerful prayer which moved all of us greatly, and I am persuaded that John died in peace. His body we buried with others near this camp and marked the grave with a log. His things we will send to you. The savages are greatly treacherous. We traded with them as friends, but after a great storm of rain and thunder, they came at us before light and many were hurt. I myself was shot in the leg. Master Ashley is bound to stay in these parts till the traitors are rightly punished. Your obedient servant, Hugh Glass. This letter denotes not only Glass's deep sense of humanity, but it's the first mention of Jedediah Smith's piety and character from one of his contemporaries. Jedediah Smith would mount an expedition along with an unnamed French-Canadian trader to a nearby fort in hopes of mounting even larger retributive forces to supplement those that Ashley had already mustered. After this, he would carry on to travel perhaps more country than any other mountain man ever. The stories of the exploits of Ashley, Glass, and Jed Smith are too numerous to summarize in one episode, though rest assured we will be delving into their stories again soon. But for tonight, those are other stories for other times. But what do you think? Could this incident have been prevented? Or were these two cultures on a collision course in which conflict and combat were inevitable? 
British Columbia, Canada, June 16, 1811. Aboard the American fur ship known as the Tonquin, fur trader James Lewis lies below deck, mortally wounded. His breathing is labored, and he strains to listen to the native warriors that are just now pulling their long dugout canoes up next to the hulking vessel. He does not know their language, and thus he does not know what they are saying. But he knows why they are here, and James Lewis knows what is about to happen. The chilly waters that surround the vessel situated in Cleoquit Sound were seemingly empty just minutes ago. Now they seem to swarm with war canoes, dozens of them, filled with angered Cleoquot warriors. Soon the plodding of moccasined footsteps begins to cause a low rumble as if a thunderstorm is brewing somewhere far away. Lewis begins to feel sick, the noxious effects of his physical state and his psychological distress. But his resolve remains steady. His gaze drops momentarily, and he stares blankly into the room full of gunpowder kegs outside of which he lies, propped up against one of the sturdy wooden walls of the ship. He again studies the line of dark powder stretching from his position into the room. He is tired. The night before had been the longest of his still young life, in which his thoughts had drifted from his current situation to his family and friends at home, whom he knows he will never see again. He had also had much time to ponder the events of the previous few days, and just how he had come to be here, alone, below decks of this expensive and well-traveled ship. Lewis had been part of a crew of American, French, Canadian, and native fur traders under the employ of the legendary business and real estate mogul, John Jacob Astor. They had traveled to this distant locale in the hopes of trading with the natives for the valuable beaver pelts that were, at this time in the 19th century, a highly profitable commodity. For the next few days, they had anchored offshore of these idyllic lands and bartered a number of profitable trades with the locals. Though the men on board the Tonquin and the local Cleoquiat had respective origins thousands of miles away from each other, they were well aware of each other's existence. Though America as a nation extends only to the Mississippi River at this point in the early 19th century, the American fur trade is a globalized industry. The fashionable beaver felt stovepipe hat at this time is all the rage in Europe as well as the more cosmopolitan urban centers in America. Cafes, parlors, and street corners are all replete with young men sporting their most stylish new headgear. In what might be considered both the height of irony and a wonder of a worldwide supply chain, it is the fashionable fancies of the European upper classes that drive the day-to-day -day lives and livelihoods of people more than half a world away. Throughout the entirety of North America, fur trappers roam the rivers and streams hoping to ensnare the valuable animals in their steel traps and send their bounties out to market by way of St. Louis or Santa Fe. And on the open seas, American vessels routinely made the treacherous journey around Cape Horn and up the west coast of North America to the Pacific Northwest, where they traded for furs with local natives. Within a few decades' time, the entire system would implode, as changing fashions and waning beaver populations would prove too much for the market to bear. However, in 1811, there is scarcely a more profitable trade on the whole of the continent, and men are driven to great lengths in their quests to build their fortunes. Perhaps most prominent among these men capitalizing on the fur boom is Johann Jakob Astor, better known as John Jacob Astor, a German-born American immigrant who had capitalized on the Jay Treaty that was signed by the United States and Great Britain in 1794. The treaty opened new markets in the Great Lakes region as well as in Canada. Astor signed a contract with the Northwest Company based in Montreal. Astor would import the furs from Montreal to New York and then ship them to Europe to be purchased by hat manufacturers. By the turn of the 19th century, he had amassed a fortune of roughly $250,000, over $6 million by today's standards when accounting for inflation. However, in 1807, the U.S. Embargo Act was enacted by Congress, closing off trade with Canada and severely disrupting Astor's business dealings as his connections in Montreal were now illegal. In response, Astor obtained direct permission from President Thomas Jefferson to establish the American Fur Company which he did in 1808. Over the next few years, Astor would use the American Fur Company, or AFC, as well as its subsidiaries 
to gain control of virtually the entirety of the Great Lakes region, as well as secure several lucrative contracts. Intending to hamper his former employer in the Northwest Company, as well as the juggernaut of the industry in the Hudson's Bay Company, Astor soon began to finance expeditions to the Pacific Northwest, in hopes of monopolizing the fur trade with the natives there before his rivals could gain a foothold. This had been the driving force behind Astor's purchase of the Tonquin. In 1810, Astor created the Pacific Fur Company, a subsidiary of the American Fur Company, to expand into the Northwest with intentions to both explore the territory and to establish favorable relations with the natives. Astor had purchased the Tonquin, a 290-pound bark, 96 feet in length, and outfitted to carry 22 cannons from the Fanning and Coles Company, who had sailed the ship to China to trade for cheap goods in 1807. Astor purchased the vessel for $37,860, roughly $700,000 today, on August 23, 1810. He hired the most experienced fur traders he knew, mostly Scottish and French-Canadian voyageurs who had long plied their arduous trades amongst the natives of the Great Lakes region. And to command the ship, Astor sought out the services of a short-tempered and staunchly disciplined ex-U.S. Navy captain named Jonathan Thorne. Born in Schenectady, New York on January 8, 1779, he was the first of 15 children born to Samuel and Helena Horn. He became a midshipman in the U.S. Navy at age 21 in April of 1800. Thorne participated in the Tripolitan War, also known as the First Barbary War, in 1801. Thorne was part of a small group of volunteers that accomplished the dangerous mission of sneaking into the harbor at Tripoli, Libya, and destroying the captured American frigate known as the Philadelphia on February 16, 1804. On August 3rd of that same year, Thorne also participated in the attack on Tripoli Harbor led by Commodore Edward Preble. He was commended for his conduct during the engagement and was given command of one of the captured gunboats. While serving in the New York Navy Yard, he was promoted to the rank of full lieutenant in February 1807. At the time, Thorne was the youngest naval officer to ever command a United States Naval Yard. Still, despite his relatively rapid ascension within the ranks of the Navy, Thorne's correspondence to friends and family at the time betray a young man internally besieged by self-doubt and various physical ailments. Thorne would serve in the Navy until 1810, when he was granted a two-year furlough in order to sign on with John Jacob Astor for a job as captain of the Tonquin. But as much as Astor's thought processes were logical, he would simply hire the best, most experienced men he could for each position, they lacked an overall accounting for the variability of human temperaments, perspectives, and experiences. And, unfortunately for the men embarking on the Tonquin, there were scarcely two cultures more at odds than that of Captain Thorne's disciplined navy and that of the purely pragmatic, often romanticized voyageurs. The Tonquin set sail from New York City on September 8, 1810, carrying a crew of 34 men. They rounded Cape Horn and stopped off in Hawaii before arriving at the mouth of the Columbia River on the 22nd of March, 1811. During the entirety of the journey, Captain Thorne had proven increasingly at odds with the voyageurs. They found him wildly overbearing, while he found them slothful and disorganized. Thorne saw his obedience to the orders of Astor as his primary responsibility, while the voyageurs viewed themselves as skilled and knowledgeable tradesmen who had hired on for a job they intended to do well. However, they had no intentions nor inclinations to adhere to what they saw as the captain's overly strict policies and timelines. En route to the Pacific Northwest, Thorne's adherence to schedule was tested beyond what he considered to be reasonable bounds. On December 4, 1810, when the Tonquin had pulled into Port Egmont and the Falkland Islands in order to gather supplies and make minor repairs, eight men had ventured into the interior of the islands in hopes of procuring more provisions. When they proved slightly tardy on their return, Thorne saw fit to sail away with the remainder of the crew and leave the eight men stranded on the remote island. Desperate and with little other option, the eight men struck out desperately in their rowboat in hopes of catching up with the Tonquin. After six exhausting hours, the men in the rowboat managed to come within sight of the Tonquin. One of the crewmen, a man named Robert Stewart, 
threatened to kill the captain should he not turn around to rescue the men and the rowboat. Thorne, rightfully taking the threat quite seriously, obliged to steward in his cohort's demands, and the eight crewmen were subsequently rescued. While Thorne had seen the action as a necessary imposition of discipline, the trappers and crewmen, who were not military men, saw it as a dishonorable and wholly condemnable action. Thorne, for his part, had become increasingly frustrated with the laissez-faire attitude of the fur traders. He found the jovial atmosphere they created as inappropriate, dismissive, and even dangerous. By the time the Tonquin sailed into the waters of Hawaii's Kaleakua Bay on the 12th of February 1811, the crew and the captain were seemingly irreparably at odds. Though he was a stalwart disciplinarian, Thorne did see the necessity in maintaining at least some semblance of cordiality between himself and the crew. So, while in Hawaii, Thorne finally made a temporary peace between himself and the senior partner fur traders. Thorne recruited 24 Hawaiian Kanaka laborers to assist in the day-to-day -day work that awaited the crew of the Tonquin upon their arrival in the Pacific Northwest. The Tonquin left Hawaii behind on March 1, 1811. Three weeks later, on March 22, 1811, the ship came into sight of its most formidable challenge yet, the Columbia River. Among the tasks that Thorne had been charged with by Astor was the building of a permanent trading post near the critical geographical point where the Columbia River pours into the Pacific Ocean. Even today, the swirling, raging waters of the area provide a daunting task for sailors in modern-day vessels to navigate. But Thorne was unmoved by the fearful sight of the violent, churning waters. His concern was only the task at hand. Thus, on a particularly stormy day, he ordered five men to cast out in a rowboat and make their way into the middle of the waters to sound the bottom or determine the depth of the water so that the larger ship could find a spot on the formidable sandbar deep enough for it to get through. The terrified men beseeched Thorne with heartfelt pleas for their lives, as they saw venturing into the turbulent waters before them as tantamount to suicide. J.C. Fox, a veteran Boston sailor and Thorne's first mate, was appointed to lead the task. He was ordered to take a crew composed of three French Canadians who had never been to sea before, and an aging Yankee sailor who would be of marginal use at the oars. He protested vociferously to the captain, who only dismissed the terrified young man by turning his back to him and remarking that if he was so afraid of water, he should have stayed in Boston. Thorne ordered them to carry on, insisting that he needed all of his experienced sailors to man the ship in the midst of the repressive squall they were currently enduring. Ultimately, Fox mournfully obliged. He sorrowfully addressed his comrades, saying that his uncle had left his bones at the bottom of this channel only a year before, trying to make the treacherous crossing himself, and that now he would join him. It would be only minutes later when the boat would capsize amidst the waves, killing all five men on board. Three days later, on the 25th of March, 1811, Another crew of five men was ordered to repeat the same mission that had killed their unfortunate comrades scarcely 48 hours earlier. Their small rowboat met the same fate, being capsized in short order amidst the crashing waters. However, this time, one American crew member and one of the Hawaiian Kanakas managed to miraculously make their way to shore after a horrifically harrowing ordeal that saw both nearly succumb to drowning and then hypothermia. The next day, the Tonkin was able to navigate past the sandbar laying anchor in Baker Bay. Thorne and the remaining members of the crew then came ashore. Over the succeeding few weeks, the crew of the voyageurs and the remaining Hawaiians would construct a trading post. This post would blossom into an economic hub and is today the town of Astoria, Oregon. As they labored, much of the conversation amongst the men was conducted amongst themselves in their native tongues, so as to be indiscernible to Captain Thorne. But it was clear to the captain from their tone alone, that the crew were nearing a mutinous fervor. Still, the mission carried on. As the months passed, trade was carried out with curious locals, such as the Clatsop people, a Chinookan tribe that had been encountered by the Lewis and Clark expedition in 1805. Thorne pressed the Clatsop for information on any of their neighbors to the north who might be open to trading as well. He was referred to the Cleoquiot tribe, who resided around the Cleoquiot Bay some 430 miles to the north. The Cleoquiot, meaning the people from Cleoqua or Cleoqui, had recently engaged in peaceable trading with a number of European merchants. 
they were a hunter-gathering people, descendants of the Nunchanuls. Scant years before, in the late 1700s, they had engaged in prolonged and vicious intertribal warfare in efforts to rid their territories of foreign invaders from rival nations. Thorn was encouraged by the potential profit source and dismissive of any military threat that might be posed against his superiorly armed men aboard their state-of-the-art ship. And so, on June 5th, 1811, the Tonquin again crossed the sandbar, leaving the waters of the bay and heading north again towards current-day Vancouver, British Columbia. As they traveled north, they stopped intermittently to come ashore and trade with other tribes along the way. During one of these stops, they hired a local native named Jose Kiao to serve as their interpreter as they continued on northward. Thorne was again cautioned against venturing into the Cleoquiat's territory as they had recently had some tense dealings with other European traders. Thorne, again, dismissed any threat posed by the natives paddling cedar canoes and wielding homemade war clubs against his mighty and well-armed vessel. During the second week of June, the Tonquin finally made its way into the waters of Cleoquiat Sound. Alexander McKay, the most experienced Scottish fur trader on board the ship, and Jose Akial went ashore to establish relations with the Cleoquiat. They were received peaceably, even being welcomed to stay the night in the chief's longhouse. The next day, as McKay and Jose Akial established trade on shore, a number of Cleoquiat canoes went out to the Tonquin in hopes of bartering for more goods than McKay and Jose Akial had brought with them. Before leaving to come ashore, McKay had cautioned Captain Thorne of this eventuality, and warned him not to let too many Cleoquiat on board at once. Thorne, wholly inexperienced in trading with natives save for his most recent dealings in the past few weeks, brushed McKay's concerns aside, again reassuring him that the Tonquin's might rendered it practically invincible to native attack. As curious Cleoquiat clambered on board, Thorne ordered several blankets spread out on deck and trade goods laid upon them. Believing himself a shrewd bargainer, Thorne attempted engaging a Cleoquiat elder, a chief known as Nukami, in trade. He offered two blankets, an assortment of beads, and a number of metal fish hooks in exchange for one otter pelt, an offer he felt to be more than charitable. Nukami, however, was an experienced and shrewd dealmaker, a veteran of countless dealings with Europeans and other natives throughout his long life. He rejected Thorne's offer outright, scornfully condemning it as egregiously low. Nukami insisted on five blankets. Thorne saw this as outright extortion. He angrily turned his back to the chief, stalking off towards his quarters. The chief, indignant himself, followed the captain, taunting him for being such a weak bargainer and waving the otter pelts in the air. Incensed, the captain grabbed one of the furs and, according to varying accounts, either struck the chief with it or rubbed it in his face, shouting, Damn your eyes! He subsequently threw Nukami and all of his cohorts off of the Tonquin and sent word from McKay and Hosea Kiao to return. McKay was horrified at the captain's pomposity and the experienced traders in the crew now all believed themselves to be in great danger. They insisted that now was the time for the Tonquin to pull up anchors and to take its leave, but Captain Thorne would hear none of it. Just after sunrise on the following morning, a singular canoe appeared on the water, pulling up next to the Tonquin. Captain Thorne, as well as much of the rest of the crew, was still asleep. The Cleoquiat inside the canoe held up furs and made overtures of peace towards the crewmen on watch, who were convinced to let the small ship come aboard. Captain Thorne, as well as McKay and Jose Akial, were summoned to the deck, and trading was commenced. But soon, more canoes began to flock to the Tonquin. At first, just a few, but then more, and then more. Again, McKay and Jose Akial beseeched Captain Thorne to only allow a small group of Cleoquiat on board at a time. Again, Thorne dismissed their concerns wholeheartedly. Jose Akial then noticed that many of the Cleoquiat warriors wore fur mantles draped over their necks and shoulders, a curious wardrobe choice considering the warm June weather. Yet again, the captain roundly condemned the idea of being caught off guard by a surprise attack. Finally, the number of Cleoquiat on board the Tonquin became unmanageable, and yet still, the canoes continued to pull up next to the Tonquin. Finally, Thorne was forced to order the decks cleared and the topsails unfurled 
and the anchor, Wade. The mood on board the ship, and that of Thorn in particular, was rapidly devolving from one of joviality to one of panic suspicion. As the preparations were being made to move, and the Cleoquiot were being ushered off the Tonquin and back into their canoes, James Lewis, acting as the ship's clerk, had been hunched down next to a bale of blankets, taking stock of inventory. Suddenly, a startling, bone-chilling war cry rang out, piercing the muggy summer air. The Cleoquiot chief standing next to Lewis brandished a large hunting knife, burying it deep into the unfortunate American's back. Lewis fell forward into the ship's companionway, alive but grievously wounded, and a massacre ensued on board the Tonquin. McKay, standing nearby, was the only crewman who had broken the typical policy which barred anyone from carrying arms above deck without explicit permission and snuck a pistol into his waistband. With the advent of the attack, McKay, the seasoned, strong-willed Scotsman, pulled the weapon and made use of its single shot in disposing a lone Cleoquiat warrior. The other warriors immediately leapt upon McKay, bludgeoning him mercilessly with the war clubs they had concealed beneath their furs. McKay was then tossed, barely alive, into a canoe where he was dispatched by Cleoquiat women with large oars. Next to fall was Thorn, who in fact fought valiantly and viciously with a pocket knife he kept on his person as he made a desperate bid to get to the cache of weapons kept on board. He managed to eviscerate four of his assailants, though he suffered several grievous wounds in the process. He, too, was soon felled by a mighty strike from a war club. The bulk of the pitiable crew on board were then cut and clubbed down over the next few minutes, as the Cleoquiot exacted their revenge for the captain's disrespect. Every sailor on the decks was killed, save for the native translator, Hosea Kiao. Also still alive was James Lewis, who had dragged himself into the shadows and hidden for the remainder of the attack. Now satisfied, the Cleoquiot took what goods they fancied most and returned to their canoes, rowing across the placid, chilly waters as the imposing Tonquin now sat still with its crew cold in death. However, in a miraculous oversight, the Cleoquiot had overlooked the seven sailors who had climbed into the ship's rigging to unfurl the topmast. After the Cleoquiot made their exit, the sailors made their way to the deck and then below deck where they found the dying Lewis. Lewis, resigned to his fate, had told the remaining survivors to cast out in one of the rowboats and that he would stay behind. He burned for revenge against the Cleoquiot and sought to make his last act his retribution. He requested only that he be left with a line of gunpowder stretching from where he lay to the ship's powder magazine, which contained nearly 9,000 pounds of gunpowder. He would wait until they returned the next day, which all assumed to be a certainty, as there was still so much valuable loot left on board. Then, he would blow the ship up. This, he hoped, would create time for his cohorts to escape and eliminate as many of their pursuers as possible. After jarring farewells, the men left Lewis alone with his thoughts as they slipped away in the rowboat. And now, here he sits, retching in pain and smiling to himself as the ship grows heavier and heavier with the weight of the Cleoquiot climbing on board. Before long, roughly 200 warriors swarm the deck and holes of the once mighty vessel, now but a carcass to be scavenged. Perhaps Lewis takes one last look at the brilliant British Columbia sky, or thinks once more of his upstate New York home, or the Hawaiian Islands, the Falklands, the bar rooms of New York City, or the beaches of Oahu. Then, as Jose Kial watches from the shore, unaware that there are any survivors at all, the Tonquin erupts and what is likely the largest explosion that will be seen in the Pacific Northwest until World War II's battle for the Aleutian Islands. A din of grief and horror erupt from the Cleoquiot assembled on shore as a giant fireball consumes what is left of the Tonquin within minutes. Not only is this a tragedy for the Cleoquiot, but the explosion has not served its secondary purpose in providing a distraction for the escaping sailors. According to Jose Kial, they are soon blown to shore by a fierce gale and captured. In retribution for the killing of their tribesmen, the sailors are summarily tortured to death. It will be weeks later when word finally reaches Fort Astoria, passed on by reluctant natives 
who now seemed to be inexplicably fleeing the area. Save for Josia Kiao, who is now a prisoner of the Cleo Quiat, there are no survivors. The entire crew of the Tonquin, as well as the ship itself, have been lost. Word will make its way to Aster, who will find himself much aggrieved, but more determined than ever to establish a trading foothold in the territory. But the many tales of Aster's ambitions, as well as those of the plight of the peoples of the Pacific Northwest who will suffer untold hardships in the years to follow, are, for tonight, other stories for other times. Southeastern Alaska, and what is today Sitka, Alaska, June 27, 1802. As the relentless summer sun beat down upon them, a group of Russian fur trappers, sailors, laborers, and native Aleut hunters went about their daily tasks. Some busied themselves cleaning furs, others cooking meals, gathering firewood, and any number of other menial tasks their frontier existence might require of them. They had settled here three years earlier, having come from their native Russia in search of otter and beaver pelts. Many hailed from Siberia, from the native tribes of that austere and unforgiving land. They had sailed across the Bering Strait, landed, and been attacked by the native tribes, been forced to take to sea and head further south until they came to this area on Alaska's panhandle. Here, they constructed a large fort, complete with living quarters, livery stables, a large two-story main hall with a basement and veranda on all sides, a cookhouse, a warehouse for all supplies, and a blacksmith shop. Their commander, a man named Alexander Andreevich Baranov, had labored intensely on not just the fort's construction, but on fostering and developing alliances with the tribes on whose territories they were constructing their empire. But one tribe in particular proved incessantly troublesome to the Russians. The Klingit were a feared and fearsome hunter-gatherer tribe that had risen to prominence via centuries of raiding and warfare up and down the Alaskan panhandle. They struck in lightning-fast, unabashedly violent mini-raids that had terrorized their neighbors for generations. They had been wreaking intermittent havoc on the outpost, which Baranoff had named New Archangel St. Michael since it had been constructed. The Klingit had fought long and hard to take this land and to keep it, and they did not take kindly to interlopers not only intruding but depleting their area of game, otter, and beaver. And though they had exacted some toll on the Russians already, on this day the Klingit would strike their greatest blow yet. At about one in the afternoon, as a young Russian named Ambrosium Plotnikov returned from checking his cattle that were grazing near one of the inlet streams, he heard a loud commotion back at the fort. He rushed back over the ridge separating the stream from the bay and saw what must have been a blood-chilling sight. Roughly 60 Klingit canoes were coming around the point of the bay, heading straight for the settlement. These were large spruce war canoes, carved with ornate designs and carrying dozens of bear and wolf-skin clad Klingit warriors, their faces painted black all around the eyes to give them a fierce, ghastly appearance even in the midday sun. They were armed with spears, bows, arrows, and a considerable amount of firearms, many of which had been acquired by a trade, whether indirectly or directly, with the Russian merchants. The warriors paddled deftly in the turbulent bay waters that gave the Russian oarsmen many difficulties, and when they landed, they dispersed like a pack of wolves they had named themselves after, the Wolf Clan. These were experienced warriors, who had conducted countless raids like this, but on this day, this target was particularly valuable. Not only because of the captives that could be taken and either ransomed or used as slaves, but for the supplies and weapons that were there. And, last but not least, for the larger message it would send to these intruders from the West, who had come to deal with their enemies, steal their land, and empty their streams. The Klingit intended to send a message so brutal that it would be carried back to the chief of these foreigners, and he would finally decide to end his subjects' forays into their land. Unfortunately for Ambrosium Plotnikov, he was a poor Russian peasant in many ways as much a victim of Russian imperialism as those whose territory he had encroached on. He was a poor laborer who had either desperately fled a terrible situation at home 
or been forced into work as a laborer for the expeditionary party due to his low social status. He could exercise no effect on geopolitical policy, nor could he hope to combat several dozen war canoes full of Klingit warriors. All the young Russian could do now was hope to save his own life. Initially, he made a dash for the shared living quarters of the workers, but, to his frustration and terror, found it locked and empty. With no time to investigate or take in the totality of the situation, Plotnikov made a mad dash for the stables where he had made a habit of keeping a gun. As Klingit warriors began to swarm the village, their animal-shaped heads giving the illusion of wolves, ravens, and Kodiak bears rushing about the camp in a whirlwind slaughterhouse intent on exacting revenge on these unrepentant intruders, Plotnikov reached the stables and grabbed his weapon. He began to move about the stables, fortifying positions under windows in an attempt to construct some kind of ad hoc defensive position, when he discovered a mother and child hiding in the far corner of the stable, clearly terrified. Plotnikov told the woman to flee to the nearby woods and hide, and that he would stay in the stables and cover her retreat. She did as he suggested, and fled to the comparative darkness and concealment of the thick boreal forest that surrounded the settlement on three sides. Meanwhile, Plotnikov used what fleeting moments he had to fortify his position and lock down the doors. In short time, the Klingit warriors had made their way through the settlement, and four of them had turned their ire on the stables, attempting to gain access by demanding the door be opened, then simply bashing it in. They seized Plotnikov by his heavy coat and took his gun. However, as they were tussling, Plotnikov managed to slip out of his coat and made a mad dash for the woods. His pursuers quickly terminated their chase, seeing the bounty of supplies in the stables as more enticing than one additional Russian. After hiding for a few hours in the woods, all the while being tormented by the incessant screams of both his compatriots and the Klingit, Plotnikov made a tentative return trip towards the settlement in hopes of gauging the damage done and trying to link up with other survivors. What he saw as he hid behind a ridgeline near the camp likely scarred the young man for the rest of his days. Out through the windows and carrying them to the canoes which had been brought for the purpose of taking them away. I saw one of our men jump through a window of one of the burning buildings only to be picked up on the fighting knives of the savages and thrown back into the fire. I also saw them cut off another man's head and throw the headless body into the flames. However, Plotnikov was soon spotted by two Klingit warriors, who chased after him in their animal headdresses and predator furs in what must have been a petrifying pursuit for the Russian. Plotnikov managed to again hide in the forest for a few hours, then made a second attempt. By this time, the screams had abated, and the macabre scene that greeted the young laborer that day was one of a nightmare. Except, in this case, it was all too real. The buildings were still on fire, the ground littered with dismembered bodies, and assorted sundries that the Klingit had either dropped or seen unfit to carry away. Plotnikov noticed some of the cattle he had been watering earlier that very afternoon milling about, and noticed that several had Klingit knives stuck in various spots about their bodies. He attempted to make his way to them in hopes of at least providing them with some relief, when he was spotted again and again pursued into the woods by the remnants of the Klingit raiding party. After his narrowest escape yet, Plotnikov took shelter under a large tree and spent a shiftless, terrifying night alone in the dark, trying to keep his breathing quiet and listening as intently as his weary ears could for the footfalls of more Klingit warriors. The next morning, he heard the roar of a group of muskets firing. Again. He fled, this time up the mountain. On his way, he met up with three other survivors, another young mother, her child, and an old man who had managed to escape despite being quite ill. This group managed to stay together in the Alaskan woods, hidden from sight as best they could, for eight straight days and nights. Every day, Plotnikov would venture down towards the St. Michael settlement in hopes of finding some kind of rescue effort that had been sent by concerned parties back at the capital of Kodiak. He thought they would eventually become concerned at their lack of goods and correspondence coming out of the easterly settlement. Flush with a mix of panic and joy, 
Plotnikov dashed out of the dense forest and onto the rocky strip of beach that stretched out in the bay in an effort to hail his presumed rescue party. But again, Plotnikov was spotted by two Klingit who had remained in the area and was again compelled to escape into the forest. To his surprise, the ship was actually an English vessel that had made its way from England to Boston, down and around South America, and up the Pacific coastline in their pursuit of beaver and otter furs. Nonetheless, Plotnikov was exceedingly grateful to them for saving he and his brethren from a plight that had been long feared to be terminal. He returned with a small guard to his party that had been left in the woods, only to find that in his absence, another survivor had managed to find the mother, child, and old man. This man, a fellow workman named Baturin, was taken with the rest of the party to the relative safety of the ship. The next day, Plotnikov and Baturin implored the captain to make a trip back into the settlement to both assess the damages and to bury their dead. The captain granted their request, again with a small contingent of armed guards. What greeted them was a truly horrifying sight. The headless bodies of men they had lived and worked with, crossed oceans with and braved dangers with, celebrated Christmases and feast days with, now lie strewn about the ground like so much refuse. They were given as dignified a burial and funeral as could be managed by the devoutly orthodox Russian contingent, and then the men made their way back to the ship that sat waiting in the bay. The ship remained in the harbor three additional days, getting ready to travel back to Kodiak should no more survivors be found. On the third day, however, a group of Klingit canoes pulled up next to the ship, assuming they were an English vessel full of Englishmen whose intentions were not to stay, but to trade for furs. The Klingit chief asked if they had seen any Russians, in a cryptic attempt to ensure the English had not been informed as to what was happening at the settlement. The captain lied and said they had not, and invited the chief on board to trade. The chief and his cohort, including his wife, climbed on board the English vessel, and they were all summarily placed in irons. The remainder of the Klingit still in the water were all informed that their chief would not be returned until all Russian captives had been returned to the English. Furthermore, he informed the Klingit that if they did not do this, he would hang their chief from the yardarm of his ship. At this time, two more English vessels pulled up into the bay. All three captains of all three vessels joined forces in resolutely demanding the return of all hostages. In response, dozens more Klingit war canoes appeared, in a defiant display meant to show that they too meant business should any harm be done to their chief and kinsmen. However, not wanting to see their chief dead at the hands of British sailors, the Klingit brought forth two women and four children. They insisted that these captives were all that they had, but the British captains all agreed that they were lying. And so, in typical martial maritime fashion, the British officers ordered open fire upon the Klingit canoes. In one riotous three-ship folly, hundreds of Klingit fell dead, wounded, or found their newly perforated canoes sinking into the frigid bay waters. Terrified of further reprisal, the Klingit brought forth the remainder of the captives and quickly made their way north to the cover of the inlets and forests. The British vessels sailed to Kodiak, where their traumatized Russian passengers disembarked, their individual fates, including that of Ambrosian Plotnikov, being largely lost to history. However, the Russian Empire would not suffer such an affront without exacting their retribution. Plans to exact their revenge on the Klingit were already in the works before the British rescuers had even bade them farewell. The Klingit were all too kingly aware that they had not seen the last of the Russian intruders and did not take the threat lightly. They constructed a fort at the inlet of the river, strategically located to spot and intercept any attacks from Russian ships. One young warrior among them, Kotlian, burned for revenge on the Russians. He even kept on him a blacksmith's hammer, stolen from the forge at the St. Michael settlement. He vowed to one day drench its iron head in Russian blood. Two years later, in 1804, Kotlian had risen to the rank of chief. One day, late in the fall, he was alerted to the sighting of Russian ships on the horizon.
one can only imagine how he snugly gripped his cherished hammer, elated and maybe even a little relieved that his chance had now arrived. The Battle of Sitka in 1804 would prove to be a pivotal, climactic battle in this struggle between martial powers and their efforts to control the often inhospitable but perpetually invaluable Alaskan coastline. And to be sure, that episode is coming soon. But for tonight, that's another story for another time. July 14th, 1828, Southwestern Oregon. As the initial rays of sunlight struggled their way through the dense forest canopy and vaporous morning fog, finally reflecting on the rippling waters of the Umpqua River, a group of four men prepared to cast off in their dugout canoe. Their intention is to find a more passable route of travel rather than the circuitous, marshy path they had found themselves on in the last few days. Three of the men are part of a 15 to 20 person band of fur trappers making their way north to Fort Vancouver in hopes of trading some of the fruits of their labors for some much needed supplies, horses, and a respite from the omnipresent threats presented by the wilds of the Pacific Northwest. For them, the conditions presented by their current environs are at once shakingly unfamiliar and tranquilizingly routine. They had been making their way across the American West for the better part of two years, from St. Louis, across the Salt Lake Desert, the Mojave Desert, over the Sierra Nevadas, and up from Southern California to Northern California, and then on to Oregon. They had seen all manner of hardships along the way, from grizzly attacks to hostile Mexican government officials to attacks from hostile native tribes. Less than a year earlier, some of these men had been among the few survivors to emerge from an attack by the Mojave tribe in the austere, Joshua tree-strewn desert that bears their name. They hailed from all manners of backgrounds and ethnicities, though most were American Protestants from states like Pennsylvania, Virginia, Ohio, and New York. Though their diversity in culture and experience makes their collective categorization all but impossible, it is safe to say that none among them had seen wilderness like what they had encountered in the previous few weeks. They had made their way up from the San Joaquin Valley in central California, northwest through giant redwoods to the northern California coast. They had hung close to the coastline, staying as close to the water as possible during the low tide and moving back up toward the timber as the water level necessitated. As they made their way north, they found the terrain and the native tribes less and less hospitable. The fourth man in their crew, though, felt right at home as they paddled up the frigid river lined with Oregon white oaks. He was a member of the Umpqua tribe, an umbrella group of several smaller subgroups, all of which had resided here in the Umpqua Valley for generations. Specifically, he was a member of the Lower Umpqua Band. The etymology of the word Umpqua is thought to trace back to a word from their neighbors to the south, the Talawa tribe. It is theorized to mean a place along the river, or thundering water, or dancing water, or bring across the river. They spoke the Siuslaw language, lived in cedar plank houses, and survived by both hunting and fishing in forests, streams, and ocean inlets in their home territory. They were also, like most tribes in North America at this point, increasingly impacted and influenced by the encroachment of Europeans and North Americans in their homelands. Like most tribes along the Northern California and Southern Oregon coastal ranges, the Umpqua were not averse to violent retaliation in response to trespassing in their territory. But they were not averse to making their lives easier either. However masterful the Umpqua, and for that matter any native tribe, may have been as woodsmen, life for them was still incredibly difficult. Not only was hunting made easier with firearms, but cleaning and dressing the animal were often easier with steel knives than with stone tools. Falling trees and splitting firewood was a far less laborious task when using a steel axe obtained from the whites. Though beads made from seashells and bones were indeed beautiful, the glass beads from the European and American traders could be garnered in a wider array of colors and a far greater quantity. Medicines, foodstuffs, blankets, fabrics, and gunsmithing services were all highly valued goods and services 
that most tribes could procure through few if any other sources than via trading with the whites. This led to an unavoidable mixing of cultures and a variety of cultural, economic, and military alliances. Though clashes were frequent throughout the West, as had been the case for the trapping party in the preceding weeks, the prevailing rule was that the enemy of one's enemy was one's friend. Many in the modern world often create a fundamental false binary of simply whites versus natives, when this does a fundamental disservice to both groups. The native tribes from Alaska to Argentina lived in harsh, conflict-ridden worlds in which life was a constant struggle for resources and safety. Just as in the modern world, pragmatism often won out over cultural purity in the interest of survival. Though this party of mountain men were clearly and presently trespassers in Umpqua territory, they could perhaps serve more utility as allies than enemies, or so the Umpqua had initially thought. And, for their part, nothing would have made the mountain men happier, though many among them were certainly partial to the ardent nationalism of the early 19th century, almost all were cultural and economic pragmatists first and foremost. Their goal was not to acquire territory, nor to entice the native tribes into a fight. Quite the contrary, their endeavors were essentially purely economic in nature, and thus many mountain men prided themselves on their ability to navigate the turbulent waters between such wildly different cultures. This was especially true for the leader of this party, the young but already legendary Jedediah Strong Smith. Though he was only 29 years old, he had already spent a decade of his life in the wilds of the American West. He had been born in 1799 in what is today Bainbridge, New York, to Jedediah Smith Sr. and Sally Strong, longtime New Englanders of staunch puritanical stock. The family moved to Erie County, Pennsylvania when Smith was still a boy, and by age 13, his innate thirst for adventure led him to find a job as a clerk on a Lake Erie freighter. Here, he came across a number of frontiersmen and fur trappers, many under the employ of the Hudson Bay Company. Thoroughly regaled with tales of daring, adventure, and riches had from capitalizing on Europe's obsessive demand for New World furs, Smith set out for St. Louis at the age of 17, and by 1822, census information shows him living in the burgeoning, though doubtless still austere, frontier city. Here, his hopes of obtaining employment with a fur company expedition were realized when he, along with 99 other adventure-hungry young men, answered a newspaper ad in the Missouri Gazette. The ad was posted by General William H. Ashley another eventually legendary figure in the history of the mountain men and fur trade in the American West. General Ashley called for 100 enterprising young men to head northwest to the Rockies in search of beaver pelts that were used to make the hats now so in vogue in London taverns and Paris cafes. In the spring of 1823, the company, known to history as Ashley's 100, left St. Louis and Jedediah left his old life behind forever. He had risen quickly through the loose commandatory hierarchy of the fur trapping companies, comporting himself with courage and composition time and again under the duress of frustration, starvation, thirst, and combat. He had seen countless close friends die in violent ways, endured seemingly endless travel and privation, and seen his boyish good looks scarred forever after narrowly surviving an attack from a grizzly bear. Through it all, Smith had been noted for his moderation, his piety, his reliability, and his skill as a woodsman, marksman, and trapper. Now though, as he found himself seated in a canoe next to his Umpqua guide and trapper compatriots, Jed Smith was tired. He had come thousands of miles, seen so much, and yet still had not managed to acquire the financial success he had hoped to nearly a decade ago. As the iridescently haunting rays of sunlight began to poke more and more holes in the forest canopy, one can imagine the deep sense of fatigue that must have set in as Smith surmised his current situation in its totality. He and his men were all travel-weary, within striking distance of starvation, and summarily weakened in both body 
and mind. The preceding days had been worryingly turbulent, and they must have weighed heavily on his mind. He and his men had encountered the Umqua a few days earlier in a trade meeting that encapsulated the terse, uncertain, and all-too-human nature of Native and Euro-American interactions spanning from the 1400s to the 21st century. Having spotted some Umpqua sentries at a distance, Smith and his party made signs to parlay and initiate trade in hopes of both restoring their supplies and building an amicable relationship. Unlike their Spanish predecessors and American successors, this party of trappers hoped not to conquer or colonize, but merely to peacefully pass through on their way to Fort Vancouver. Even the most ardent extoller of the virtues of manifest destiny among them would concede that now, with a party of not quite two dozen objectively overworked and severely undernourished trappers, was not the time nor the place to attempt a conquest of any kind. The Umpqua, who at this point in history rarely saw any white men, were simultaneously wary, curious, and confused. And given even a cursory glance at the territorial geopolitics all along the western coast at the time, but specifically in California and Oregon, it is quite understandable why. Though California had long been ostensibly under the control of the Spanish, the English and the Russians had, at this point, spent decades making forays into the ocean inlets and mountainscapes of the Pacific Northwest in hopes of laying claim to its innumerable resources in both flora and fauna. Private interests such as the Hudson Bay Company had also spent small fortunes on incursions deep into the unknowns of the region in hopes of establishing networks of native tribes and collecting intelligence on any potential natural boundaries to be had. In the Treaty of 1818, the United States and Britain, awash in the geocentric hubris of the time, agreed to share exploratory custody of a territory that was not theirs to begin with. Regardless, in the intervening decades, the Umpqua and their neighbors had seen a marked increase in the frequency and size of the expeditionary parties making their incursions into the territory. They had been intermittently accepting of and hostile to such incursions, but in recent months had warmed to the idea of building amicable relations with white traders in hopes of fortifying their own wealth. Jedediah Smith and his party had hoped to capitalize on this, though their interactions with the Umpqua's neighbors to the south had been terse at best and violent at worst up until now. However, seeing the only prudent course of action as taking the most amicable route, Smith intended to make some good trades and build at least some usable amount of rapport with their reluctant, suspicious hosts. The two parties had convened the mountain men's camp on the west side of the bend in the river. At first, the mood was suspicious. However, after some initial offers and counteroffers, both sides began to relax, and a sense of reserved joviality seemed to prevail. Then, one of the men informed Jedediah Smith that an axe and a skinning knife had gone missing from the party's supplies. It was apparent that, if one of the trappers had not taken the missing items, one of the Umpqua had. Though known for his magnanimity and charity in such situations, Smith had learned through the incessant native thievery that had plagued his party since the Dakotas that no amount of charity would render the goods returned. And so he saw fit to employ more forceful measures. The suspected Umpqua was detained by Smith and two others, tied up and interrogated as to the whereabouts of the axe and knife. For hours, the suspected Umpqua denied any and all knowledge of the missing items. Interestingly though, even during this time, trading continued amongst a number of smaller parties in which the hungry trappers bartered for shellfish and berries the Umpqua had brought to trade. Finally though, the axe was found amongst the detained Umpqua's effects, though the knife never was, and he was free. Though he was indeed guilty of the theft, this particular Umpqua was a chief amongst his people and now felt much aggrieved at his treatment by these American interlopers. He retreated across the river and complained to his fellow chiefs, demanding some kind of retributory action be taken in defense of his honor. The most senior chief in the group dissuaded him from this pursuit, though, arguing that he had not been so egregiously assaulted as to merit the killing of the trappers. 
However, it would be only a short time later when that same chief, having re-engaged in trading with the trapping party, was himself offended. The two conflicting accounts of what happened next are as follows. In the Umpqua's recounting, the chief in question thought it would be greatly amusing to write about the camp on one of the fine mounts in possession of the trappers. The trapper who owned the horse ordered him off at gunpoint, and a fight then and there was narrowly avoided. In the trapper's account, the chief was in no uncertain terms directed to dismount, but no kind of firearm was brandish. Despite the disparity in accounts, in either case, an immediate confrontation was avoided. The Umpqua met again across the river and decided that immediate retribution was still not the most prudent answer, and so the auspices of normality with the trappers should be maintained. Hence, the Umpqua who had agreed to guide Smith and his cohorts upriver agreed to stay at the campsite with them in order to leave the next morning. Before his companions left, though, plans were made for exacting the revenge the Umpquas felt to be rightfully theirs. Ostensible agreements were made to resume trading the next day, and the trappers fell into preparing their meals and readying themselves for a night's sleep. Jedediah Smith had his suspicions as to the Umpquas' intent, but could do little more than feign normality and carry on with the evening's tasks. With his small force against the several dozen Umpqua, here in the middle of nowhere, any attempt at an offensive attack would likely result in their small party being overrun. Though there is no record of it, Smith may have conferred with his more senior party members as to the most plausible courses of action. But no determined defensive plan was set in place, nor were the men notified of any suspected heightened threat. However, the next morning, As Smith and company warily paddled their canoe around a bend in the river and out of sight, many in the camp were still asleep. In the succeeding hour or so, many would wake up and begin their morning tasks of checking their equipment and procuring themselves some breakfast before setting about the more laborious tasks of their day. Smith, Leland, and Turner, along with their guide, carried out their intended mission of scouting out a more desirable route to travel. As they made their way back, they paddled with the vigor of men looking forward to a hearty breakfast after a hard morning's work. Then, just as they approached the bend in the river around which they had disappeared earlier that morning, they heard a riotous commotion coming from the camp, still hidden from view. As Smith, Leland, and Turner conferred with each other as to what the cause might be, the Umqua guide snatched Smith's rifle and in one deft, intentional motion, tipped the canoe over spilling them all into the river. The Umpqua swam to the western bank, while Smith, Leland, and Turner made it to the eastern bank, just in time to take cover from a volley of fire coming from a hidden group of Umquas their former canoe mate had swum to for cover. They made their way to the top of a low promontory overlooking their campsite from across the river, and were greeted with a scene that must have haunted their nightmares for the remainder of their lives. All of the men in camp were now dead. Only minutes before their arrival, as their friends and comrades were still waking, a force of 200 Umpqua had overrun the camp. Some of the men had been cooking breakfast, some cleaning their weapons, and some were still asleep in their blankets when they were fell upon and cut down in a matter of minutes by Umpqua war clubs, hatchets, and arrows. Smith and company could only watch on as the aftermath unfolded, in which all of their belongings, including furs they had worked two years in acquiring, were either stolen or destroyed. Their livestock milled about nervously, made skittish by the sudden commotion and iron scent of blood. Eventually, they too were taken by the Umpqua. One man, Moses Black, had managed to dive into the river and escape his pursuers. According to his later account, he had been cleaning his rifle when two Umpqua appeared seemingly out of nowhere, and demanded he relinquish his weapon to them. Black had refused, and after a short tussle, he had turned and ran after being slashed across the back by the Umpqua's knives. He had managed to jump into the river and avoid the arrows and rocks that rained down around him, making it to the eastern bank of the river and escaping. 
On his flight to the river, he had seen Thomas Virgin being hacked to pieces by a pair of Umpqua warriors and another trapper, whom he believed to be Thomas Dawes, being chased down by a group of Umpqua in a canoe. Smith, Leland, and Turner, however, had no knowledge of Black's escape, and thus both parties, Smith and company as well as Moses Black, believed themselves to be the sole survivors of the massacre. However, regardless of their communication breakdown, the only viable destination for any trapper lost in that hostile country was to make their way north, as the party had originally intended, to Fort Vancouver. A torturous hike of roughly 200 miles up rocky shoreline and through unforgiving woodlands that would be incredibly taxing for even fit, well-fed individuals. It would not be until August 8th that Moses Black would struggle to the gates of Fort Vancouver. He was half dead and being nearly carried by a kindly Tillamook native who had taken it upon himself to guide the starving, desperate man to his destination. At first, Black could not bring himself to speak, so shaken were his nerves. The commander of the fort ordered the gates opened and for the clearly traumatized man to be brought in and cared for. After being wrapped in blankets and given a warm drink, Black was able to still his nerves long enough to articulate the horrors of his plight. A retributive excursion was immediately planned by the fort's commander, Captain John McLaughlin. Runners were sent out to the surrounding tribes, notifying them that a handsome reward would be paid to any natives who brought in survivors of the recently perpetrated massacre. The next day at around noon, Smith, Leland, and Turner staggered to the gates of the fort, themselves in little better condition than Moses Black. They too had procured Tillamook guides after making their way roughly 120 miles up the coast. Though both Black and Smith's party were all thrilled to learn that they were not, in fact, the sole survivors of the massacre, their cross-referencing of accounts also confirmed the sad truth that there were no other survivors. This, as in so much of the history of the Old West, is also a matter of some dispute in differing accounts. Umpqua accounts speak of two native women who were traveling with the party and were left unharmed, even eventually marrying into the tribe. Though they were not mentioned in any of Smith's journal entries, nor in the accounts of his contemporaries, that does not mean the Umpqua accounts were untrue. It would not have been uncommon for parties of trappers to provide either employment or safe travel to local tribespeople as their comparatively sizable and well-armed contingent made their way through the territory. However, we do know that every single trapper present other than Smith, Leland, Turner, and Black was killed there at the campsite on the Umpqua River. Their names were Thomas Dawes, John Gaither, Abraham LaPlante, Emmanuel Lazarus, Touchant Marichal, Martin McCoy, Joseph Palmer, Peter Ranney, Harrison Rogers, Charles Swift, Thomas Virgin, a former slave known as Ranza, and perhaps most tragically, Marion, the Indian boy whom they had taken into their party, by some accounts forcefully, in order to provide him with either protection, use him for labor, or both. All died tragically violent, terrifying deaths under a dark forest canopy thousands of miles from most of their homes. Smith left only two written accounts of the attack, one to his brother and another to William Clark. Both are relatively terse in nature, and though sorrow is undoubtedly expressed on Smith's behalf, the veneer of his imperturbability remained uncracked. Undoubtedly, though, Smith and the other survivors were all psychologically traumatized and burning for revenge. Smith was informed by a sympathetic Captain McLaughlin that all would be done within his power to restore what property he could of Smith's, but that marshalling an all-out assault on the Umquas was highly imprudent and thus out of the question. Crestfallen and physically depleted, Smith, Black, Leland, and Turner would eventually recover enough to make their way southeast to the yearly mountain man rendezvous in present-day Wyoming. Smith would eventually make his way back to St. Louis, and after a short-lived retirement from the mountain man life, find himself on the Cimarron River in present-day Kansas. It would be here, in 1831, that Jedediah Smith, legendary mountain man, 
would meet his end at the hands of the dreaded Comanche. But that, like the plethora of other harrowing stories from Jed Smith's short but remarkable 32-year life, is another story for another time. But what do you think? Were Smith and company the victims of a misunderstanding, or did they reap the just deserts of intruders in foreign lands? Were the Umpqua justified in their attack, or could diplomacy have prevailed? Let us know what you think in the comments. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, and ring that notification bell, and if you'd like to support our work, you can become a monthly contributor on Patreon, link included below. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, History Too Real for the Westerns. Thank you.